there for you because we're always there for you because that's what we're here for. We're bringing you anything and everything that's going down in Hollywood, and especially today with uber mega producer Ken Monk coming on the show to yes. talk about his uh, directorial debut that he also wrote, uh, The Right One. Yep, The Right One. And I mean, guys, if you don't recognize the name, this is the guy behind, basically what, the he's like the godfather of unscripted television. Yes. America's top model created it. Making the Band created it. He's also the uber producer behind Invincible with Mark Wahlberg. Remember that one? And Joy with Jennifer Lawrence and Bobby. 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 Yeah, he's he's the producer behind that one. This guy is like everywhere. Yeah. So I mean, all the up and comers are gonna love this one. Like we said, he's everywhere, wh- whether it be indie projects, blockbusters, or uh, scripted content. Like yes. he's dabbling a little bit of everything. Everybody can learn a little bit of something from him. But that is later on the show. Now let's get a little crazy. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Crazy Ant Farm. Holy moly, we're on episode 145 this week. Yes, and... Wowzers. First episode of season four. Here we are. That's right, guys. We are officially kicking off our fourth year... It's crazy. ...of Inside the Crazy Ant Farm. What? Absolutely bonkers, man. What? I couldn't think of a better way to do it, either. You guys heard him tease Friends theme song and everything, WandaVision. Yes. What? Oh my goodness, guys. It dropped today. Oh my God, bro. We're going to be talking about that, of course. Of but course. like, woo! I know. It's a perfect way to start season four. Agreed. Agreed. Saying. And you guys know your host with the most, myself, JLo Fantastic, and the one and only Mouth. What's up? Oh, man. If you're new to the podcast, uh, we basically talk about anything and everything that's going down in Hollywood. If it's going down, we are talking about that's it. That's right. Oh, man. But we got a lot to talk about. Uh, more delays, possibly, from the studios. I mean, a lot of stuff is is still expected to come out early 2021 theatrically and i don't know if it's gonna happen yeah i don't know if it's gonna happen i don't know if it's smart thing to happen i I mean yeah and i mean kevin feige talked a lot this Mm. week i mean there was an interview where he was just dropping a whole bunch of stuff i mean it was crazy it was crazy i mean like it was supposed to be promotion for wandavision but it was promotion for everything mcu just basically just like Boom! We got it all. So much stuff, all. guys. So much stuff. Uh, but before we get this thing started, be sure to head over to our website, www.crazyantmedia.com. Antoinette is now up yes. on the website. Barton got a girlfriend. Yes, he, he does. Got a girlfriend uh, now. He got that life partner, man. <laughs> Everybody's so excited. Girl Power is finally here, man. Yes. I mean, just rock it right now. We got the Girl Power. We got a little Valentine's Day design that we got coming out here soon, and her just by herself. I'm ready to buy one right now. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and good luck, Bonk. We hope it doesn't end the, the way the other Antoinette story ended. Yeah. Nah, man, you good, you good. It's fine, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but like we were talking about uh, like a couple seconds ago, COVID-19, 2021, this thing is still here, still rocking and rolling sadly yes. as of right now the big five which is disney warner brothers paramount universal and sony still have numerous uh remaining on the release calendar for early 2021 like i said uh and i mean there's like 65 percent of theaters including those in the popular markets that are like new york and los angeles remain closed yeah so, so see that's <laughs> like, like 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 i don't understand that it, it it's like how are we still have numerous films on the release schedule if 65 percent of the theaters including the ones in the only markets that matter yeah are closed it's, i don't know like, I, don't, I don't know how that like makes sense where these movies make the most of their money like they're still shut down so i don't know man i don't know i i Still, everybody needs to stay home, and the theat or the streaming right now, and the simultaneously, that's just a band aid. It's just putting it over the wound. It's a temporary thing. I think it's the best thing for right now because Los Angeles just shut down again. We've talked about that multiple times. Nobody's allowed to travel there. Nobody's really allowed to go out and about. So it's a very dangerous time, and we just need to do what we got to do. Yeah, and yet Hollywood doesn't care. They don't. Hollywood is still doing th- guys. Los Angeles, COVID is so bad there that 10 people every minute Mm. are being diagnosed with COVID. Yeah. And yet, the studios are still moving forward with going back into production after this latest hiatus. They're like, no, no, we got to get back to shooting again. We're going to do it. 
10 people every minute are diagnosed with COVID. Yeah, just like, this week, freaking 12,000 new cases, uh, close to 300 deaths, and nearly 8,000 hospitalizations. I, I just... I, those numbers are mind-boggling. So, no. look, I get it, okay? We talk about this all the time on the show about 99% of the industry are not Tom Cruise. They're not George Clooney. <laughs> yeah, they're not the exactly. mega millionaires. These people work project to project, paycheck to paycheck, and are struggling right now. I get that. But with those type numbers, I mean, is that the safest? Like, like, hey, let's get them all back to work? Like, I just don't know, man. I know. It's kind of like giving them money with poison on it. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, as soon as they touch it, it might be bad, might be deadly. And that's what it is. Every time they step out of their homes, it could be potential like catching the virus. So it's a very scary time. Like I, I see both sides, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure you come home to your family and that they are okay as well. Yeah. And you cannot guarantee it for every one that we hear about that there were no issues right we've had guests on come on and say oh yeah we filmed and there were no issues and we were right. safe and everything was great but then we also report about two or three that have been shut down because of covid Multiple even though times. they were you know following all the safety protocols and everything so you know if if for one good they're three bad those numbers just aren't good yeah. and i just i don't know man i think it's too risky i know i completely agree i think it's way too risky right now i mean i know everybody needs money everybody needs money but with biden coming in and i He's already talking about another 1,400 uh, stimulus coming out here soon. So, I mean, let's just trust the government and hopefully they will do the right thing. I know that's hard. Don't get me wrong. I know that's freaking hard. <laughs> what but was it Reagan said? The scariest word you'll ever hear. Trust us. We're the government. I know. Ugh. I know. I just uh, but, you know. don't want to see innocent people die because they wanted to put food on the table. Yeah. I mean, it's we're in a pandemic. It's, it's true. It's freaking crazy. It's, it's freaking true. crazy. Well, let's go over to Disney, the mouse house, the big juggernaut. Like we said said feige was talking a whole bunch of stuff marvel but there was also a question in there about star wars and apparently a lot of stuff we have been seeing has been leaked and not officially confirmed yet that's and right i saw that they said um they asked him if he was also going to head up star Wars or lucas films as yeah. well. and he's like i've got a lot of marvel shit to take care of so i can't even start to think about that yeah yeah he he made it perfectly clear that his primary focus was the mcu which is good i don't yeah. think one person should try to balance those no two. no and i mean remember guys and we're going to be talking about it he he always talks about how they've always kind of got things planned out for five or six years right right so we know he's got phase four and well into phase five planned out for the next how would you ever try to do okay i'm gonna also balance star wars yeah like that i mean it's impossible it's yeah. impossible um in case you didn't hear at the top of the show, WandaVision dropped today. Yes. We finally have Epic. MCU content on Disney Plus, and it was fucking brilliant. It was great. I, I, I just, I, we're not, no spoilers. We're not going to give you any spoilers, but they did drop the first two episodes. Soak that in because from now on, it's only going to be one a week for the next yeah. seven weeks. But I love it because it's nothing like Marvel has ever given us before. No, nothing and then, like it. And then yet, everything like Marvel. Yeah. Because they kind of like, they tease like there's some shit going on, but you'd swear to God you were watching the Dick Van Dyke show. Yeah, let, let, seriously. I mean, it's so unbelievably brilliant. Kudos to everybody involved in the making of it. You guys are going to fucking love it. But like you said at the top of the show, Feige was on this like press tour for WandaVision, right? Yeah. And rightfully so. He's pushing it. But woo! He said, you know what? Let's talk some MCU. Let's do it. And so we're going to go. We're going to bounce back and forth here. We're going to fill you in because he, man, he dropped so much stuff. As I just said, he talked about how he's got the next five or six years planned out with the MCU. That's pretty much the standard. That's the way it goes. So that should take them through at least 2026, guys. Before, you That's know, awesome. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. It it's really crazy. is. And he also touched on how Disney is not con uh, considering simultaneously releasing Black Widow on Disney Plus and theaters. But they did admit and they did say that another delay is in sight. Yes. I mean, yep. it makes sense, man. But that's it's scary it's really scary because i feel like we might never see this thing that's right to be honest that's true now this next one this next one because that's bad we want to see black widow like uh, wait you know. are you seriously but this next one is going to get people excited because we all know that when feige doesn't say no because you'll see when we keep reporting these news things he definitively says no a lot yeah this one he didn't nope this one he didn't feige didn't confirm or deny 
the Spider-Man 3 casting rumors acknowledging that all three Spider-Men are going to be in it, Oof. okay? And he did acknowledge that some journalists, fans, and online sites have come actually pretty damn close to being <laughs> right about what's going to happen in Spider-Man 3. And then he laughed and chuckled and said, of course, there's a lot of people that are like so way the fuck off, yeah. it's not even funny. Kind I thought of a that thing. was funny. But the fact that he would not definitively say no screams to me that that's a yes. I agree. That's, a, that, that's Feige. Oh, that's Feige, man. right? Like so, mm. so super pumped about that. And he also talked about more Avengers movie. Now, it is going to be a whole new team. I mean, you, we saw the original yep. six kind of like branched off and were doing their own thing. And he said that there will be plenty of superheroes to choose from for the next Avengers squad when they finally make their appearance. But that's going to be a while because we're in Phase 4 right now. Yep. And Phase 4 is all about introducing you to new characters that you thought you knew and of course like we talked about on previous shows new characters just in general uh like black widow i mean that's the one we thought we knew but we're going to get a little bit more from the film and of course we're going to be introduced to the new characters like the eternals shang chi uh moon knight she hulk and more on miss marvel so yes epic Rumor has it, uh, you know, the um, showrunner of She-Hulk was wearing a Kitty Pride mm. t-shirt the other day. Mm. And like so many people pointed out, that you don't just do that. That, yeah. that, that was clearly intentional. So could we see? We're hearing all kinds of stuff that there's going to be rotating guests in and out. And so strong possibilities that WandaVision is introducing mutants and like all. So Kitty Pride showing up would be like an epic thing on yeah. She-Hulk, right? I mean, that would be just so damn good. We should say Feige also said that the the Avengers will not be in Phase 4. So when he said a while's away, it will not be Phase 4. There will be no Avengers movie in Phase 4. So I there you go. That. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he also said, I'm a little disappointed about this because he clearly were introducing mutants. We can finally say that now with WandaVision, you know, and everything. But... But, guys, there's no definitive plans at the moment in place. He says they talk about it every day. They, are, they brainstorm about it every day. But no definitive place or plan in place right now to introduce the X-Men into the MCU. Not right now. Yeah. Not right now. I feel so. like they have to do that right. It's just like the Fantastic Four, they have to do that the right way. Yeah. So, yep. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, Feige did confirm that Deadpool 3 will be rated R, which is fantastic. The script is being worked on as we speak, and Ryan Reynolds is overseeing that. Uh, the film won't begin until 2022 at the earliest, though, so it's going to be a while. And you know what that says to me? Probably when we'll see X-Men. Yeah. I, I would assume those are all going to fall along the same timeline because, you know, Deadpool is so linked to Wolvie and the X-Men. and I mean, that would just make sense to me. Plus, I think the Fantastic Four is coming first. Yeah. I mean, I, that j- just a guess. Just a guess. He also confirmed, putting it to bed, putting it to rest right now because the people just keep running with rumors and everything. Chadwick Boseman will not be recast and they will not CGI him. There will not be any kind of like crazy cuckoo stuff going on in Black Panther 2. They are going to pay tribute to him, but he said that the movie is going to be around all of the other people and culture and stuff that goes on in Wakanda and will deal with characters other than T'Challa. So that screams that, you know, Siri's going to take over as, you know, uh, Black Panther. That, yeah. You know, but anyway, put it to bed, put it to rest, over, done with, no recasting Black Panther and no CGI. So. Agreed. I think CGI and freaking dead people is really weird anyway. So I'm glad they're doing this. <laughs> I'm really glad they're doing this. Uh, they, f- they actually released the uh, run times and the episode count for each show, which is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is going to be six episodes uh, each one hour long. Yep. Uh, Loki is going to be six episodes each one hour long. Yep. She-Hulk is going to be ten episodes uh, 30 minutes long. Miss Marvel is going to be six episodes with each being an hour long. Moon Knight is going to be six episodes each being an hour long. And WandaVision, we've talked about this multiple times, being nine episodes and 30 minutes long. But now only seven because we're two down. Yeah, right? Watch it. You got to watch it. Um, let, let, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Secret Invasion. I think after Captain Marvel, the end scene in Captain Marvel, everybody was kind of thinking, oh shit, how long have they all been on Earth? How the Secret Invasion storyline. He confirmed, they're right. You're right. 
It is Secret Invasion. That is a storyline that is in the works. It is going to happen, but not on the scale of the comic book storyline because anybody who's a comic geek, and I know we have a lot of listeners out there who are, you guys know it was much bigger than Infinity War, much bigger than Endgame. The, 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 the scale of you know Secret Invasion was massive. And he's like, nope, not going to happen. It's just going to be really like a story to highlight Fury. Uh, okay. Like, that's fine. All right. Yeah. You know, because if you're going to make a show and you're going to cast Samuel L. Jackson, it should highlight Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> plus, like, at the end of, uh, I believe it was Captain Marvel, that freaking, uh, the scroll and Fury, I mean, they were still working together, like, way down the line. So, I'm, yeah, I wonder how all that comes together. I don't know. I guess that's apparently what the series is going to be about. Right? So, boom, boom. There you go. Right there. Um, May... I- Kalawa Mawe, yeah, right, <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, we'll be joining Moon Knight in a key role. No word yet on what role she will be playing, but it could be a brand new character that plays a key part in this story. And the show is eyeing a start date in March, uh, kicking yep. off production in Budapest. And also, just broke right before we started the show, Ethan Hawke has also joined the cast. And details about his character are being really kept under wraps. Mm. And uh, he's supposed to be the lead villain though that's what they're all saying yeah so that's interesting i mean i'm pumped for moon knight he's always been one of my favorite he's like marvel's batman mm. but he's got some powers yeah so but like marvel's batman so you know there you go okay remember what we said about spider-man remember what we said about feige like if he definitively says no like we just talked about in black panther right definitive no definitive no for x-men definitive well, here's another one where he wouldn't give a definitive no, which means it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm so super pumped about this <laughs> because, I mean, and that's one of the rumors for Spider-Man too. Charlie Cox's Daredevil, yeah. right? All right, of course I'm talking about all the Netflix Marvel series, right? Well, here's what he said. Everything is on the board when it comes to those series. He says when it comes to Daredevil, Punisher, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, all of them, there are some great characters and some great actors that brought those characters to life with those shows and numerous opportunities moving forward. Man, man. That sounds like a, they're all going to show up at some point in the MCU right. to me. I, I mean, just yeah. that seems to be pretty. I mean, rumor has it that Cox is going to be either in She-Hulk or in Spider-Man 3. Which would make total sense. Now we're hearing that maybe Jessica Jones is going to pop up in She Hulk. Yeah. Which would make sense because in the comic books, She Hulk and uh, you know Jennifer Walters and and Jessica Jones are friends. Mm. They're pretty tight. So that would make sense. So who knows? Yeah. But I'm pumped. Yeah. I mean, those freaking actors like portrayed those characters perfectly. I thought it was brilliant. So yeah, it would be really awesome to see them actually make that leap into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Absolutely. Just be fucking badass. <laughs> um, this next one is kind of surprising, but. For the right reason. Yes. Uh, filmmaker Jamin Chu, who was set to direct the pilot episode of uh, the Willow series for com- upcoming for Disney+. Plus, uh, He is exiting the project over scheduling conflicts uh, because he has a new baby on the way. Yeah. And UK has been shutting things down because of COVID, shutting things, opening things, shutting things, opening things. <laughs> and with, I mean, the new baby, it makes sense. So if things don't work out for your family, it makes sense. Choose family every time. Absolutely. Yeah, always, always. That, I, I mean, I like that. I respect that. Yeah. I think. It, plus, you don't want to be on a set where there could possibly be COVID and everything. You bring that shit back home to your pregnant wife. Exactly. Like, what? No, 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 you would never do that. I mean, no. come on. Um, ooh, Ben Affleck's moving into uh, like a whole new kind of film. Yeah, this is you know? interesting. Like supernatural kind of family film fun type kind of like, what? But he's coming on board at Disney yeah. with, with his Pearl Street Film Productions company. Uh, they're going to take on the best-selling book series – Keeper of the Lost Cities, mm. which Affleck is going to uh, on board to direct and produce. Uh, if you guys know, the series centers on a 12-year-old telepathic girl named Sophie who's searching for answers about her secret abilities, learning she's not actually human, but from another world. Oh. oh. So that sounds pretty badass. Yeah. I mean, and and, and Affleck is going to do this. Yeah. 
I mean, that's gonna be badass. You know, you think Favreau's gonna kind of take him aside and say, "Here's how we do these type movies." Like, listen, like I, I'm just saying. Right. <laughs> Favreau has got the genre down. Agreed. Just saying, they're both brilliant directors. Agreed. Just saying, so. I mean, he needs to step behind the camera more. I, in my opinion, in my opinion, I do. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think he's proven himself to be not that he's a bad actor, but no, I just think he's proven himself to be a much more apt director. I agree. Than actor, so you know. I agree. I agree. This next one is really cool. Hulu is cutting the price from its basic ad supported service for all college students get this it's only going to be two dollars a month uh the regular price for everyone is already six dollars a month with this isn't bad at all um the ad free tier is twelve dollars a month uh the disney owned streaming service operation describes the 65 percent discount as an evergreen deal mm. uh and i mean given the college students that ability just to be able to stream things in this crazy ass time uh is amazing i think it's a really good idea i wonder how that works with the bundling package. Hey, uh, you know, it's it, let me tell you, this is brilliant marketing because college age students, they're going to eat. You know what you do? You run ads for Disney Plus. You run right. ads for WandaVision and Mandalorian and everything on Hulu because now, you know, that $2 a month is going to be ad driven. So you just, you show the, and then that's going to attract that age group, that demographic to jump right on to fucking Disney Plus. Agreed. So it's brilliant marketing. I mean, it just, uh, man. Agreed. Disney, man. Disney. You guys know what to do. Doing some great um, things. Oh, more people are joining uh, Women of the Movement. Remember we were talking about this last week? Um, Chris Coy, Julia McDermott, and Carter Jenkins are going to uh, co-star opposite Adrian Warren in Women of the Movement. Remember, guys, we told you about that this is the one about Emmett Till's mother and the struggle uh, and grandmother that went through to bring justice to him after all all these years um that's exciting they it just keep exciting. adding some big names to this cast which i think abc is gonna i'm gonna i think i'm just gonna say i think they're gonna see big numbers with this uh, yeah i think I it's do. gonna be a breakout show that everybody's gonna watch or at least should watch we're gonna be watching it and we'll be sure to tell you to watch it every week absolutely um fx announced that danny boyle the director behind praise films such as slumdog millionaire steve jobs transponding uh he's gonna direct and executive produce Pistol, and it's going to be a six-episode limited series about legendary Sex Pistols guitarist Steve Jones. Oh, I love how they're doing these biopics in different ways, too, episodic and uh, theatrical or um, cinematic or whatever, movies. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I think that's really cool. It is really cool. Because I feel like a lot of musicians' stories go untold. Absolutely, and and we, you know, we've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks, too. They're booming. They are. It makes sense that everybody's jumping on the board and doing these things because they're they're just rocking on all these streaming services. So congratulations for that. Uh, la, 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 la. Oh, oh, no. Mr. Robot creator and director Sam Esmail's pilot for the new drama Acts of Crime. Mm. Apparently, ABC has officially ordered it to series. The show has been in development at Walt Disney since last September. Damn. So uh, clearly a victim of those yeah. will we, won't we COVID stuff, right? So um, details on what the crime procedure will be about are under wraps. Yeah. Not I always. like this, too. And the statement mentioned that the series will be a unique spin on the genre. Yeah. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Robot, right? right? That should give you, like, all kinds of clues right there. Like, like this guy's a brilliant genius. Um, so I'm excited to see what he does with this. Yeah. Emmy Rossum's husband, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Had no yep. idea. Learning something new every day. Yep. That's, <laughs> that, that's his significant other. Boom. That's right a power there. couple right there. Yeah, that's seriously. What I'm just saying. Um, speaking of Mr. Robot himself, Rami <laughs> right? Malek uh, and Zoe Salda, Salda uh, have joined the ensemble cast of David O. Russell's upcoming <laughs> movie at New uh, Regency. And it's an untitled film in which the plot details are still unknown, but it's got a huge freaking cast attached. Christian Bale, I mean, Margot Robbie, John David Washington, Robert De Niro, Mike Myers, Michael Shannon, Chris Rock, Anya Tara Joy. Oh my goodness, there's so many people attached to this this thing yeah okay yeah Woo! somebody's excited about this one that's all i'm saying it's like boom uh timothy elephant just and bobby bobby come on you said and bobby like anything with bobby and david o russell is just like yeah i'm just gonna say it. agree that, that, that's, <gasps> we've talked about this doogie hauser right doogie hauser doogie hauser doogie hauser it's getting rebooted it's being revived it's all good it's gonna be set in hawaii it's gonna be a girl it's gonna be awesome but we had no idea who the girl would who, be uh, yeah who was it gonna who be who was it gonna be now we know. Now we have our new Doogie. Uh, the Doogie Hauser reboot at Disney Plus. Doogie Kamahalahoa, MD. 
I, I'm so glad I'm you got that. Yeah, one. no, Kamahalahoa. I'm so glad. That actually sounds pretty Hawaiian. Yeah. Kamahalahoa. I think I did a pretty good job there. I just, I'm, it might be wrong, but it sounds good to me. It does. Uh, <laughs> they've <laughs> cast Peyton Elizabeth Lee in the title role, which keeps her in the Disney family because, as you guys know, she was best known for starring in Andy Mac, mm. the Disney series Andy Mac. She also starred in uh, Secret Society of Second Born Royals. Which uh, our our Austin Winsberg was behind, mm. you know, from uh, Zoe. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty badass. So that's good ca- casting yeah. and badass kind of you know. Yeah, I love how they always work within the family. If they have Me a too. role, they try to pull somebody up. So it's really good. I love Disney for that. Yeah. Uh, Hulu is continuing to ramp up its original documentary push with a three part series about Bigfoot. From the Duplass brothers. Yeah. The streamer has ordered Sasquatch, which investigates a rumors of a bizarre 25-year-old triple homicide that says to be the work of the mythological creature. And the series is set to launch this spring. So Damn. I know. Squatch is a murderer. He's a murderer. <sighs> Shifty, no wonder he's shady. being hunted. Like, right? Like, like no wonder he's always out of the camera. You're not sure he can't catch. I, I knew it. I knew something was shady. Yes. Oh, man. Yes. Ooh. Jump into the bunny now from the mouse to the bunny. We, but by the way, we might have and start called Disney instead of the house the mouse built. Might be the house that Feige built. <laughs> Shit keeps going. It's going to be Feige Favreau's house. Like, that's right. all I'm saying. I'm fine with but that. But the <laughs> me too. I'm fine with, I'm fine with that. Hey, call us. Call us. Yeah. Um, but we've talked about this. We, we've said, you know, jump to the bunny. How are they going to do this? How are they? Because a lot of the fucking creators, a lot of the filmmakers were pissed off yeah. after that big announcement about our movies are going straight to HBO Max as well as the theaters. And then they found out that big payday to Patty and Gail. And they were like, what the fuck? We ain't going to pay day. Yeah. Well, now they're getting a payday. Yeah. What's it going to do to HBO and Warner Media? Who knows? It's going to open the bank and uh, will it bankrupt them? Is this a smart move? Is it not? We don't know, but here is the deal. It's answering a lot of our questions. Sources say that Warner Brothers Pictures revealed they are guaranteeing profits up front to all of the collaborators of this year's slate of films to be released on HBO Max and in theaters simultaneously. It's a major step that they're taking to satisfy the filmmakers. And it's going to cost a lot of money. Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, duh. Guaranteeing it all up front. So Warner Brothers is altering their contracts with partners so they can pay these guarantee payments. And they won't be contingent on box office numbers. That means if the box office bombs because people are watching it on streaming, doesn't matter. You're still going to get like if it made $200 million at the box office and you were supposed to get this kind of bonus, you're still going to get that bonus whether it bombs at the box office or not crazy yeah. um so the deal is also said to increase odds for performance based bonuses and pay cast and crew members the revenue and the bonuses um the new deal would uh, also give anyone their bonuses at half of the box office hall normally required um there's a covid 19 multiplier so if shit goes down with covid and everything that'll play into it and apparently um yeah, they're working out with some partners to try to pay for all of it. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. I man. don't know who, who you find to pay for all it's of that. It's going to be a but big freaking penny, man. <laughs> I, I mean, because how many were there? Like, like just Godzilla and fucking Kong alone was yeah. like 200 million or something yeah. like that. I don't even know, man. Yeah, and imagine like the amount of crew people that you had on set every day for that thing. Yeah, and you're going to give them all bonuses? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Rightfully deserved, by the way. By the way. But, man. I it's know. Be... I know. It's absolutely crazy. More things that are crazy. Uh, everybody knows Ray Fisher versus DC Films and Warner mm. Media right now. But Warner Media is sticking behind their DC Films president, Walter Hamada, who just re upped his contract uh, last week that we talked about. Yep. Um, and we saw this last week as well. Ray Fisher came back at it and was saying some more shits about it. And, uh, yeah, I mean. Everybody knows he played Cyborg in the 2017 failed blockbuster Justice League. Uh, The company released a statement backing Hamada's integrity a day after Fisher put out his own comments on Twitter in which he accused the exec of uh, undermining the investigation into misconduct that was alleging that had occurred on the reshoots of the Justice League. Warner uh, CEO and chair Anna Sarnoff or Ann Sarnoff uh, said in a quote, I believe in Walter Hamada and that he did not impede or interfere in the investigation furthermore i have full confidence in the investigation's process
process and findings. Walter is a well-respected leader known uh, by his colleagues, peers, and me as a great man of character and integrity. As I said in Walter's recent deal extension announcement, I am excited to where he's bringing DC Films and look forward to working with him and the rest of the team to build the DC Multiverse. There you go. That yeah. sounds pretty definitive to me. By the way, we were talking about this earlier to, uh, amongst ourselves, but like, you know, because all the Justice League stars, Gil Gadot and Jason Momoa and all them, they came out in support of Fisher and yeah. were like right there with them about Whedon. But nobody said a bad word about, about Hamada. No, not at all. So like none of them have commented on Hamada. So while they were backing Fisher, I, I mean, I'm guessing it wasn't Hamada. It was Whedon. So, and there's no more movement on Jeff Johns. Right. And so remember last week we talked about how they were back in Jeff Johns. And so like, I don't know, man. We did know in case you missed it. Like it broke, I guess, oh, this past weekend. Fisher has been. There's no definitive removed, maybe, maybe yeah. not. Uh, has been officially removed from the Flash. He will not be recast. The character is just like completely out. I believe we like, said that last week. Out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But it's just crazy because yeah, they stuck up for him about Whedon, but now they're just like they're silent about yeah. all the other shit. So, so it's very interesting. Maybe he thought if it's a domino effect, maybe he could take one. He could take the rest of them. I don't know. I don't know what's going through his head. Like I said last week, you always want to believe the person who says these things and allegates these things, but at the same time. It's a trial. Like, I mean, it really is. You can't come to any conclusions until, like, the investigation is over. And it's just crazy, man. It's it is. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm guaranteed it's not the last we've heard of it. No. Because you know, Fisher, I don't think, is going to let it go. No. Everybody keeps saying move on, but I don't think Fisher's going to. Right. Um, Jiri and Hajaz creator Joe Barton. Remember we told you guys uh, the Batman spinoff from the movie? The Batman was getting, you know, an HBO Max series about the Gotham PD, and they yeah. lost their showrunner, right? Well, now they have a new one. Yes. Uh, it's Joe Barton. He's going to take over as the showrunner for the upcoming Gotham PD series, which, as I said, is a spinoff of the Batman movie, Matt Reeves, uh, starring Pattinson. Um, Barton steps into the role two months after Terrence Winter exited for creative differences. We still don't know what those creative yeah, differences no were or why there was an issue there or what was going on. But the Untitled Show was ordered straight to series in July and is designed to be uh, uh, an exact companion piece to the movie. So... We'll see, man. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But it is definitively Warner Media's plan and HBO Max's plan to build a multiverse of Batman yeah. within all of these platforms. So. Yeah. I mean, we called it on the show a couple months back. I think it's way better, especially now with all the drama that's going on. Just Bat Family. Do a whole Bat Family franchise. Like, I feel like that would be great. It would be. But you know who's not getting into the multiverse on mm -hmm. all of the platforms? We told you last week it was canceled, right? Green Arrow and the Canaries, no chance of getting picked up. Not going to happen at the CW. And everybody was like, but maybe, but maybe. No. Just no maybes, no nothing. It's not HBO happening. Max is not taking it either. Yeah. So like any home where it potentially would have had a chance, not being done. Well, with this decision, I'm wondering if it was more than just COVID. Like, you know, I that's would, what I'm saying, yeah. because like we know they've got definitive plans locked down with Berlanti yeah. on HBO Max with a bunch of series. So why wouldn't Berlanti bring his own people like I, I don't know, yeah. but I'm still really fucking pissed. Yeah, like, really. <laughs> fu Check out Cat McNamara in the stand, y'all on CBS All yes. Access. That's all I'm saying. That's yeah, how you great know. Great actor. Great actor. Phenomenal. Oh, Phenomenal. man. Uh, Tessa Thompson has signed a first look deal for two years with HBO and HBO Max and is executive producing two big book adaptation who fears death and secret lives of church ladies Ooh. oh shit Ooh. drama 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 it sounds like that's serious and good for her valkyrie you go girl right tessa thompson has been like one of my favorites over the last 10 years she's just been phenomenal so good for you for signing a, a deal and getting it done right i love this agreed oh. uh, speaking of drama 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 sex in the city mm. is back we are announcing it right now but man it's crazy because according to multiple sources sarah Jessica Parker, Cynthia Nixon, and Christian Davis uh, are going to get like a million dollars per episode for this new upcoming series, which is going to be titled uh, And Just Like That. And they're bringing back those three and not what's her face. She is not coming Kim back. Yeah, yeah, she is not coming back. Uh, I guess there's a lot of drama behind all that. Uh, she has said before in an interview 
just because we work together doesn't make us friends. Which, okay, mm. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But, but damn. But, I mean, like, I, and I've seen these all over the internet, too, and I kind of agree. Like, is there sex in the city without Samantha? Because Samantha was getting all the sex in Sex in the City. Fair enough. Uh, just, just, I mean, that's all I'm saying. Everybody so, else was kind of in a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Is Mr. Big coming back? Or are we going to see Chris North? Because that'd be bad. I know, right? I mean, like, it says they're supposed to, like, be going through uh navigate love and friendship through their 50s so i mean that kind of implies that he's not with her anymore so oh. i don't know oh. i don't know you don't disc there Chris needs Knopf, to be a man. freaking cameo though there does there needs i to mean be, he man. was a big part of the series and the movies i believe yeah i mean so uh, i mean uh, we don't know this next one oh, i'm excited about because i'm a cook now and i cook a lot yeah, and julia go. childs oh julia childs oh. i'm excited about this one guys hbo max has picked up the series it's drama pilot julia which is about julia julia child or you know that all the cooking and the cooking and the wine and wine and wine and wine and wine and sherry um she did a lot of wine and sherry um it's gonna be project based on the life of world-renowned chef julia child the series stars sarah lancashire and david hyde pierce Mm. from from fraser yeah yeah i'm so excited about that i love him he's great production is scheduled to resume in late spring in boston where the pilot, because they've already shot the pilot and it was picked up the series, was shot. So that's exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I, I haven't seen him cool. around in a while. No, so it's going to be really cool to see him co- come back. And in Julia. Exactly, like, right, exactly. Right. HBO also announced the upcoming fifth of uh, season of Insecure. It will be its last one. The series oh. co-created and starring is Ray, coming off its fourth season, earned nine Emmy nominations, including its first nod for Best Comedy. Uh, but, I mean, you know, everything comes to an end every now and then. At least it didn't get one season and canceled. That's so, true. Just you, you got four, so run with it, man. That's a success, right? Yeah, like, uh, exactly. They love Matt Reeves. They do. They love. You know, we just talked about his Gotham series, his Batman movie and everything. HBO's keeping that love fest going because apparently they've put into develop Matt Reeves The Future which is a one-hour sci-fi tech drama based on Dan Frey's forthcoming novel, The Future is Yours. Mm, oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, focuses on two best friends who invent the most revolutionary technological device in modern human history. It's a sci-fi series set in Silicon Valley, mm. which would only make sense if they're going to develop a technological you know, yeah, device. Yeah, exactly. That's the biggest thing ever. And I'm interested about this because it says, uh, told through an innovative multimedia style that's never been seen on TV. Oh. oh, let's see, man. Let's see what you got. A multimedia style. I know. It's never been seen on TV. I know. Is it, will it be through their invention? No. Oh. It's a great uh, question. It's a great question. We don't know. I'm going to have to check it out. <laughs> uh, this one saddens me because I was super pumped about this one. The Many Saints of Newark, uh, the upcoming film that serves as a prequel for the long-running and brilliant HBO series The Sopranos, has been delayed. Has been delayed. Again. Uh, its big screen debut uh, will now open on September 20th. 24th of 2021, uh, an entire year after it was initially planned. Uh, mm. It was originally planned for uh, September tw- or September of 2020, and then got rescheduled to March 12th, uh, and now is getting pushed back to September. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets pushed back again. Yeah. So 65% of the theaters are closed. Yeah. <laughs> Just, Just saying. saying. <laughs> um, oh, excited about this because we talked about this a little bit last week too, uh, announcing some people, Clancy Brown and stuff, joining in the Dexter revival. Yes. Well, now we know the rest of the cast has been set. Uh, Julia Jones from The Mandalorian, Alano Miller from Sylvie's Love, Johnny Savoyqua from Believe, and Jack Elcott, the good Lord Bird, have joined Clancy Brown yeah. and Michael C. Hall in the 10-episode limited series, which ooh, begins next month in Massachusetts. A lot going down in Boston, Seriously. apparently, right? Like, okay, all right. Had That's no idea cool. their fucking incentives were good. Yeah, I had no man. idea. Yeah. So uh, they kind of gave a breakdown. You guys can see it in variety or, you know, of all the characters and everything. This is going to be really, really interesting, I think. Yeah. And it's going to be completely a revival of Dexter, but set completely out of the world that we know Dexter in. So this is going to be really interesting. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm excited. I agree. Uh, Paramount Plus, soon to be rebranded.
rebranded um, from CBS All Access, yep. drops a six-minute sneak peek of the all-new SpongeBob SquarePants prequel, uh, Camp Coral. Everybody knows it's SpongeBob Under Years, uh, and it got sneak peeked uh, during the uh, NFL halftime show of uh, the Wild Card game last week, and it's going to be follows a ten-year-old SpongeBob and all of his friends at uh, Camp Coral, and they're going to be playing, and you know, uh, by the campfire and and Lake Yucky Monk. This so. is what you get when you show a Wild Card game on Nickelodeon. Literally, <laughs> you get a SpongeBob. I saw robot. somebody like actually watching it, and they were like CGI and slime and shit yeah, into the end like, zone. Yeah, like, what? Like, yeah. I mean, hey, you got to do what you got to do during COVID to get people to watch. Goodness. That's all I'm saying. Hilarious. I know you're excited about this. I one. am because I'm super into the medieval stuff right now. Thank and you. John Wick. Yeah, and John Wick. Uh, thank you, Game of Thrones and Keanu Reeves. Y'all are amazing. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has finally found its lead writer, Derek Kolstad. Uh, that name sounds familiar because it is the writer and creator behind John Wick, and he will be in charge of developing the pitch which we all know is a huge huge mm. thing in hollywood uh this project is still in the early casting phase so stay tuned stay tuned yeah oh some interesting news coming out of hollywood too and um sad because we, we sad. I mean we don't know what the outcome is going to be but um well we're going to tell you dustin diamond screech from saved by the bell you guys know him uh apparently is battling stage four cancer um, and this is the scary part. He checked himself into the hospital after enduring some body pain from shingles. And he just said overall he was feeling kind of bad. Yeah. Thought maybe he had COVID, but turns out like stage four cancer. He had no idea. Uh, yeah. I mean, just uh, he's undergoing chemotherapy and, um, you know, hopes to be making a comeback and fighting it off. They didn't release what type of cancer it is, yeah. but um, we all know stage four is not good. No. Um, so. Regardless of what you do or don't think about Dustin Diamond and, and you know, um, best wishes to him Seriously. and uh, best wishes for a speedy recovery, man, because, that you know, we don't wish that on anybody. Yeah, man. especially when you have no idea. No. It's absolutely wild. Uh, yep. NBC is also developing Des and Lou, uh, the light procedural described as Mission Impossible meets Will and Grace. Uh, what the fuck? Yeah. Follows a charming Spanish spy working for Interpol and a cynical American agent uh, from the CIA form a joint task force to stop uh, plans of a dangerous organization. Uh, this could start a beautiful friendship. Yeah. You know, they say, say meets Will and Grace, but it sounds like Lucy. Mm. I love Lucy. Yeah. It's a charming Spanish guy and he meets yeah. an American and Des and Lou, anybody that's, you know... Desi Arnaz and, you know, Desilu was the name of their production company. Yeah. Just saying. I mean, it, maybe it's more of a nod to them than Will and Grace. That's, that's yeah. just it's very throwing that out there. man. <laughs> <laughs> Throw, you know. Catch it if you want to. Let it go if you don't. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's this next one? Oh, NBC is moving forward with three of their frontrunner pilots. The network handed out series orders for comedies grand crew oh that's the one with kevin uh from uh king of uh, queens right yeah i, I think so. so kevin james right uh american auto as well as drama la brea all three series which were developed and picked up to pilot this time a year ago yeah. but remember then they held off and they didn't pick them all up to go to season because of the whole covid stuff um apparently are going to air during this coming season, the 2021-2022 broadcast season. All three pilots were front runners at the network for the past year as production at three Universal Television produced shows was delayed because of COVID. Um, so there you go. Yeah. They had to extend all of these cast members' uh, contracts because when the show wasn't picked up and gone, you know, they were their contracts were over and they were lucky. So they had to extend them all to even get this to happen. So, yeah. I mean, at least it's stuff. happening because, like, I mean, it's not green arrows on the canaries like yes so i mean at least it's happening yes it's fucking so, crazy that's cool yeah uh chicago med is bringing on uh, steven weber uh, has joined the cast uh, for the current sixth season in a recurring role he will be playing dr dean archer a oh. weary blunt talented physician who has just been relocated from a rural hospital to chicago med and he's a former navy officer who oversaw uh dr ethan Choi. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm. who is apparently a other character that is on the show. Yes, I'm excited about this one because I'm a huge fan of Steven Weber from Wings, way back in the Wings day. And uh, you guys might know him, 13 Reasons Why. He was the school principal in there 13 Reasons Why. So um, he's also 
friends with numerous of our mutual friends. He's yeah. real tight with Spencer Garrett and Jeremy Gordon and the whole gang that knows him and everything. I'd love to get Steven on the show to talk about this. Same. Talk about Chicago Med. Weber. Come on. He was nice in quarantine, it. you guys. He was. He made a little appearance in quarantine and everything. If you guys missed his live, his IG live with Spencer, mm. fuck you. Yeah, Spencer. Yeah. Spencer may or may not have been a little drunk after yeah, cooking. Yeah, quarantine. But it was fine. It's it was fine. fine. Good stuff, though. Good stuff. So Hell congrats, yeah. Weber. That's Hell awesome. Yeah. More delays in the future and right now. Uh, Sony and Marvel's upcoming Spider-Man spinoff film, Morpheus, everybody knows that's one starring Jared Leto with a sneak peek of uh, Michael Keaton, mm. uh, has been moved. Uh, the release day to october 8th uh which sucks it was supposed to be march 18th so it really freaking sucks it does suck <laughs> this next one does not suck because i'm a huge fan of miss joy bryant i think she's absolutely brilliant i first saw her and came to know her on parenthood as jasmine you guys love her yeah, but, but now she's on for life and she's absolutely brilliant there well she's keeping things going guys she is expanding her relationship with sony pictures which is behind uh, for life. Um, and her and producer, Samantha Taylor Pickett, are going to launch a production company called Hot Sauce. By yeah. the way, epic. Hell epic, yeah. Epic, That's great. Hot Sauce. Uh, and it's going to be based at Sony TV with a three-year first-look deal. Hot Sauce's mission says they are to develop and produce universal stories from unique and original voices that span the genre and culture. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, that's interesting. If anybody can do that, that's Joy Bryant. Because she's basically that. I agree. I mean, she's awesome, guys. If you don't know, go check her out on For Life and go back and watch Parenthood. What the fuck? Go do it. So good. So good. Uh, Everybody saw that Jeopardy, I mean, it started with Aaron Rodgers. They were like, oh my God, Aaron Rodgers is going to be a guest host. Well, there's more. There's more coming. Katie Couric, everybody knows her. They love her. Uh, Bill Whitaker. There you go. uh, Mayim Balik. And like I said, uh, Aaron Rodgers. But this comes after the legendary Ken Jennings guest host. So it's going to be very interesting. And when they come on to guest host, that uh, Jeopardy is going to donate to a specific charity for the guest host. Yeah, so and I gonna, think that's awesome. Yeah, they're, they're, I guess the money amount is going to match whatever the total of all the contestants earn yeah. on those shows. That's awesome. I agree. Like, well done. Well done done jeopardy yes that's why we love jeopardy exactly Ooh, you are yeah. uh, okay nope, it's, Ma- all you. Ma- <laughs> it's all you <laughs> all right let's give this a shot director and producer melina matasukas yes has signed a two-year first look film production deal with mgm the new deal reunites matatukas I, I just said her name like four different ways yeah you with really mgm did. film group president pamela abdi that's that was an easy one uh who worked with matsukas that's the fourth different way I've said it. It's fine. It's fine. On her directorial debut, Queen and Slim, which, by the way, phenomenal film. If you guys haven't seen it yet, you should totally see it. It's badass. Yep. HBO um, Max, man. Yep. It's on HBO Max. Exactly. She be- Did you guys know, though, that she, as epic as that film was, she actually began her career directing music videos for Queen B herself, Beyonce, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, and even Snoop and Alicia Keys. That's awesome. So that's bad. How many times do we hear that? Like, music video directors making their way. McGee like so many of them making their way into like the ultimate film like yeah. that's badass man. yeah that's really freaking cool but i don't know if mgm would be the one i would sign with just because i mean are they really a studio anymore okay heading over to well that, but that makes it maybe that contract will go to whoever buys it whoever buys it they're MGM. not for sale we're not for sale we're for sale we're yeah. not for sale we're for sale yeah. you're for fucking sale yeah. just say it don't just say it. it it's fine it's fine <laughs> Uh, going over to Lionsgate, Demetrius <laughs> Little Meech Flanoni uh, yeah. Jr. Well done. Thank you. And Da Vinci um, uh, from All American and Gronish are set to star in Star's drama series, Black Mafia Family. And everybody knows this. We've talked about it when it was first announced. It's coming from producer 50 Cent, Curtis Jackson himself. Everywhere. Dude, he's crazy. Everywhere. I'm so super pumped. Uh, The series uh, begins filming in Atlanta and Detroit this month. And, I mean, everybody knows it's going to be Demetrius Big Meech's Flanoli make his acting debut. And it's going to be – he's going to be starring as his father and Da Vinci will uh, portray Demetrius' uh, brother, uh, Terry – Southwest T. Flanoni. Black Mafia family is inspired by the true story of two brothers who rose uh, from a decaying street of Southwest Detroit in the late 1980s and gave birth to one of the most influential crime families in this country. Yep. Damn. Yeah. It's going to be badass. And if 50 Cent's behind it, it's going to kick ass. I agree. Because he, everything he's touched so far has turned to like mega hit. So go, go, way to go, man. Right? Just like, I, I, that's fantastic. Um, 
Sure, she won an Oscar for the piano. Yeah, no. But she was fucking rogue in the X-Men. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Anna Paquin. She's going to be the apparently the, the female lead in Lionsgate's upcoming film, American Underdog, The Kurt Warner Story. We've talked about this. Remember we told you uh, Levi uh, Zachary Levi is going to sign on and play uh, Kurt Warner. So that's going to be badass. Apparently, Anna is going to be his wife. That's awesome. So, yeah, man. That's kind of like super cool. Yeah. You, you remember the story? Kurt Warner is... Putting shit up on shelves, and then yeah. got the call, went to the NFL, and fucking won Super Bowl, right. couple MVPs, few MVPs, yeah. like, and that yellow jacket. Yeah, what the fuck? He's epic, man. That's right. <laughs> epic I mean, comeback story. Yeah. Um, this next one was kind of interesting. I didn't see this one mm. coming. Uh, Army Hammer has departed Shotgun Wedding, the upcoming Lionsgate action comedy starring Jennifer Lopez. Uh, Hammer's exit comes after disturbing comments attributed to the actor's uh, surface social media accounts over the weekend. Uh, the authenticity of those messages have not yet been verified, but everything's so questionable right yeah, now. Yeah, and he so. did not deny it. Yeah. He just said he doesn't have time to deal with this bullshit and thinks it's unfair to his family so he's just going to take it he also quietly backed out remember he had signed on to play the producer behind the godfather on that Mm, new godfather series that he also very quietly backed out of that Mm. so i don't know what the fuck is going on on with him but like you know it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Heading yeah. over to Netflix, the mega streamer Kevin Hart has signed a first look deal with his uh, Heartbeat Productions banner, and he's going to be producing and starring in four new movies that will play exclusively on Netflix. This is huge for him. He's making like an Adam Sandler deal. Yeah. So, and I mean, those movies are going to be better than Adam Sandler's, I'm betting. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you know. <laughs> there goes Sandler as a guest. Yeah. That's fine. I feel like Sandler does it on purpose. Though. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. He knows his first like 74 movies were all the same fucking movie exactly it was all the same movie let's let's not be on you know come on exactly uh, i'm just saying oh emmy winner holland taylor is set as a lead opposite sandra O oh in netflix's the chair uh-huh. a new six episode half hour dramedy starring an executive produced by O oh and co-starring jay duplass nice oh amanda pete is apparently behind this she's the creator oh. of this and kind of like this is her baby or whatever so that's fantastic and i'm a huge fan obviously of sandra O. Oh. i know you are Grace yeah. anatomy but Holland Taylor, guys, I'm old, so you might know her as Charlie's mom on Two and a Half Men, or maybe even just recently mm. in a bunch of Netflix stuff. Um, but I know her from fucking Boozum Buddies <laughs> as Tom Hanks is boss. Yeah, that's right, guys. I go way the fuck back. So I like. I'm I'm thrilled for her. That's I'm awesome. Thrilled for her. She was awesome in Hollywood. She was. Yeah, she was. So, yeah, and Netflix yeah. man and did Ratchet. Some good you know the star of Ratchet. Mm, that's yeah. her woman. Yeah. There, there are a couple. Yeah. I'm just dropping relationship knowledge. I'm just saying, you know, Sarah Paulson, they're t- together. Boom. Had no just, idea. Hey, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. That's uh, what he's here for. Uh, <laughs> Carmo Brown, a host of the Emmy-winning series Queer Eye, has joined the upcoming fourth season and final season of Dear White People in a recurring role. Uh, details about Brown's character are being kept well under wraps, but season four is slated to premiere this year, and that's a huge show for Netflix. Oh, yeah. So I know a lot of people are going to be excited about that one. Yep. Justin Simeon's a genius. Yeah. The guy, The guy. if you, do, if you don't follow him, follow him. He's just like a really nice guy and awesome, and, yeah. and give him a follow, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were speaking about Lucy. I love Lucy earlier. Yes. And I mean, Amazon announced that Nicole Kidman and uh, Javier Bardem uh, are in talks to play the television titans Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Yes. And and, uh, being the Ricardos. The film is set to be directed by Aaron Sorkin. Huge. Uh, Sorkin wrote the film during uh, uh, is set during one of the production week. Uh, it's set during the production week of I Love Lucy. So that's going to be very interesting. And it says that when Lucy and Desi face a crisis that could end their careers and another that could end their marriage. Oh. What the fuck was it? Yeah. So that's going to be really good. I saw there was some controversy about Nicole Kidman being cast as, as you know, Lucy that maybe some other people were on somebody else. But I think it's great casting. Never doubt Sorkin. Yeah. Exactly. Never doubt Sorkin. No. That's all I'm saying. This is going to be epic. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Lucy and Desi and, and uh, yeah. all of it that went down. So that's going to be great. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Oof, this was a big story this week. A lot of people were talking about this one. Chris Pratt's uh, Amazon is poised to land The Tomorrow War, a science fiction action film with Chris Pratt that Skydance developed and produced. The price for the film rumored to be roughly around $200 million, and this one was being shopped everywhere. Uh, it was scheduled by Paramount, but to be released in theaters 
is uh, July 23rd of 2021. But like I said, it was being shopped to streamers and drew interest from companies due to in part of star power. I mean, Chris Pratt is huge right now. Yeah. Uh, every major service, including Netflix, Apple, uh, they viewed the movie, and The Tomorrow War is set in a futuristic conflict, uh, one that finds uh, humanity losing the fight against an alien invasion. Ooh. Damn. Ooh. Yeah. J.K. Simmons is in this also. Yeah, he Enough is. Enough said. No, like, that's I it. Mean, come on. Chris Pratt and fucking J.K. Simmons. That, that's yeah, it. that's all you need to know. Like, yeah, another one Paramount sold. Yeah. Paramount just keeps giving Literally. them away to everybody. It's like, you have a streamer too, man. I Put know. it on your streamer. Exactly. Like, I'm sure your people can develop a paywall. Like, the premium I mean, thing. Like, like, seriously, why are you, like, you're so right. Like, why are you fucking selling? A, now, granted, I'd take $200 million. Yeah, yeah. I, Oh, yeah, you want to buy it for $200 million? Yeah. But, but I mean, you. I what the fuck is the point of Paramount Plus if you're not going to put anything on it? Like, what the fuck? Uh, ooh. Lord of the Rings. Yes. Now we know more about the upcoming Lord of the Rings series. We've been talking about this forever, and it seems like we just never knew anything that was going on about it. It's like, who will it be? Who will it not be? When will it be? When will it not? Well, now we know. They've unveiled the uh, show's official synopsis. Ooh. Mm. Here it goes. Here's what it says. The epic series brings to screens for the very first time the heroic legends of the fabled second age of Middle-Earth's history. This epic drama is set thousands of years before the events of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and will take viewers back to an era in which great powers were forged, kingdoms rose to glory and fell to ruin, unlikely heroes were tested, hope hung by the finest of threads, and the greatest villain that ever followed... The Tolkien pen uh. threatened to cover all the world in darkness. Uh. Ooh, so it's beginning in a time of relative peace, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's gonna get there, but it's gonna begin in peace. Exactly, it's gonna be fantastic. And it's supposed to be introducing an ensemble cast of characters, both familiar and new. So it's gonna be very interesting, like that. So we'll see, man. We'll see. They're spending like a billion dollars an episode. Yeah, so we'll yeah. fucking see. It was a really good synopsis. Yeah, what they spend on that, like ten million. Yeah, right there. Like, I mean, you know, no, I could have read it for half that. Yeah, it's Fine. I, I, yeah, did. I just us. read it. Call us. Call us. Uh, heading over to Apple, <laughs> Andy Samberg and uh, Andy Sierra uh, have teamed up with uh, Noah Hawley and Ben Stiller for an untitled sci-fi comedy drama that what? has landed at Apple Studios. Apple finalized the deal this week, picking up in a competitive situation. Everybody was bidding on it. Details for the project's uh, log line are still being kept in secret. But it is known that it's uh, it's an original idea from BoJack Horseman's creator and author Raphael Bob Waxberg. Yes. And Samberg is set to star and produce. The creative team will uh, look to attach a director in the upcoming months, so stay tuned for that. That's exciting. It is Talk exciting. about a quartet of talent. Yeah. Fuck. Oh, yeah. I mean, how can that thing fail? It's going to be epic. Agreed. You remember that movie we talked about a couple of months ago on the show, Kit Bag, mm-hmm. with Joaquin Phoenix? Remember, he's going to Napoleon Bonaparte and everything, and it didn't have a studio yet. Yeah. So we said, oh, we're going to keep you up to date, and where's that going to go, and how's that going to go down? Now we know. Apple. Apple. <laughs> Apple has picked up Kit Bag. Ridley Scott's uh, teaming with Joaquin Phoenix. Phoenix, as I said, will star as the French military leader and emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Yes. In this film that will track his origins and swift, ruthless climb to emperor, viewed through the prism and addicted and often volatile relationship with his wife and true love, Josephine. Yeah. Ooh, so it's going to be told through Josephine's eyes. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. Yeah. I love when they kind of like change it up and yeah. be like, hey, you know Napoleon, but now here's the other side. Yeah. Like, that's awesome. Exactly, exactly. And Apple has a boatload of money so they can buy anything and everything they want. <laughs> um, actress Ji Young Yo uh, has boarded Apple's forthcoming feature film, The Sky is Everywhere. Yes. She will join an ensemble cast that includes uh, Cherry Jones, Jason Siegel. Oh, that's, hey. That's why we couldn't get him on the show. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, Grace Kaufman and Jacquees Coleman. Um, uh, the film follows a character of Lenny who's played by Kaufman, a teen who accidentally falls in love while grieving the loss of her sister Bailey. Ooh. Uh, you is set to play Lenny's best friend Sarah. Oh. So like a comforting yeah. situation. Yeah, Jason Siegel though, I just, I, I mean, anybody from How I Met Your Mother is fan, phenomenal, fantastic and anything that they're in, you should watch. Agreed. That's just, you know 
you know we're excited about this next story because it's the only O that matters. It's true. It's the only O that matters. So we are pumped. Maybe she'll come on finally and talk about it. Who knows? Right. I, I don't know. Academy Award winner Kevin McDonald is reteaming with Emmy-nominated producer Lisa Espermarner for a two-part biographical documentary on the only O that matters, Oprah Winfrey. Yes. To air on Apple TV. So that's going to be awesome. The new doc will chronicle 25 years of American history through the lens of one of the show and one woman who rose from humble roots to become globally famous talk show host, producer, actress, and philanthropist, and best friend to Gail. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's that's uh, where. Win, uh, Winfrey and Espermer, uh, uh, apparently they have a long-standing relationship because she produced the Oprah Winfrey show from 1999 to 2009. Yeah. 10 years that's so crazy. that's awesome yeah so but we just told you documentaries are kicking ass huge and oprah is oprah of course it's gonna be massive exactly. i mean it's gonna be massive completely agree man completely agree well now it is time for the interview segment you guys know we got the one only ken mock coming on the show to talk about the right one and anything and everything he's done in his career this guy is awesome I, I totally agree. Enough said. And he <laughs> he gives like the most epic story about be prepared because when shit goes wrong and it will, you better be ready. Yeah. Uh, it's such a good story. You'll find out what we're talking about. Yeah, man. Well, here he is. Ken Mock, welcome inside the Crazy Ant Farm. How are you, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, absolutely. We are super stoked, and we know the fans are going to love this one. I mean, you've been associated with some rather large-named uh, projects, and, and we're super pumped. We're going to talk about all those. you got the new one coming, which, of course, we're going to be talking about. Um, but what we like right. to do first is kind of give a little introduction to the fans who might not be familiar with the name and, and who you are and everything. So how did you get started in the industry? Like, was it something that you always kind of knew you wanted to do, or did you kind of fall into it? What was the path? Yeah, you know, I always wanted to be in the entertainment uh, industry. Um, you know, I've been in it a long, long, long time. So, you know, I kind of went through a lot of different iterations, but the very first job I did was actually in news. I was writing and producing news for CNN. Uh, I did that for like a year or so, and then I realized I really want to get out of this business. So yeah, yeah. I managed to <laughs> I managed to get myself uh, a job as a production assistant uh, on The Cosby Show believe oh. it or not, in New York, was where I'm from. And so I worked on that show, you know, for like a year, and then I used that show to get a job as kind of like a junior executive, believe it or not, at NBC as, as a creative executive. Awesome. And then, then I went from being creative executive at NBC to a development ex executive over at ABC, and then I ended up running MTV Productions, uh, for a few years, and oh, then wow. I ended up producing um, at MTV Productions. I had my own production deal there, and that's where I, I, I created a show in the unscripted genre called uh, Making the Band. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which ran for a number of years, and then after that, I created uh, the show America's Next Top Model uh, with Tyra Banks, and that show has gone on for like 16 years. We're off the air right now, but we, we'll probably be coming back soon. And then I did a whole bunch of television at that time, and then I started branching off from producing films. And then uh, I produced a movie called Invincible with Mark Wahlberg mm, uh, yes. for Disney. And then after that, I, I produced uh, a movie called Joy uh, with uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Robert De Niro, Bradley Cooper. Um, that was directed by David Russell. Yep. And then now I have a new movie coming out uh, next month on February 5th through Lionsgate called The Right One. It's a romantic comedy that I wrote and I directed. Yes. So, uh, wow, that, that was like, and, and like an outstanding <laughs> bio. There I am. Like, that, that was about this is me. Exactly. Yes, I love that, though. I love <laughs> that, though. Putting all your cards out on the table, letting everybody know who you are. I'm going to take it back a little bit because you basically created this genre of unscripted content. I mean, people have just been copying that way <laughs> now. I mean, reality TV basically is the unscripted content. And plus, every female in my family loves America's Next Top Model. <laughs> So thank you for that. They are telling me to tell you thank you for that. <laughs> that is so funny. Right, You're welcome. Ma the making of the band, that was like the first like unscripted reality show to hit the airwaves, right? If I'm not mistaken? Yeah, that, that was right. Um, that was the first uh, unscripted show to 
get aired on a network television yeah. uh, oh, wow. uh, channel, which was ABC. We premiered the same week as a show called Survivor. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, that little one. Yeah, little yeah. one. <laughs> right. So we were the first two to, to, to make broadcast. Uh, and that was in the very, very beginning of Unscripted. Uh, you know, back when Unscripted was a very, very different world back then, it was it was a lot more fun, at least for me. It was a lot of big formats at the time, like Top Model and mm-hmm. like you know Survivor and like you know um, you know all the all the singing and dancing competition shows, American Idol, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, it was a very different world back then than than what it is now. Right. And so you know, I got in there at the very beginning. I kind of had used my um, my news writing and news producing background to get into reality because that's the skill set that you really needed. You needed to be able to write, you needed to be able to produce, mm-hmm. you needed to be able to edit. And so people who had news backgrounds were the ones who really had the early skill sets to kind of get into that genre. So I was fortunate enough to be able to be able to do that. It's so amazing too, because like so many of the guests that we've had on the show, um, in all different aspects of the, of, of the phase, like in front of the camera, behind the camera, producer, director, mm-hmm. writers, they've all come from that news background. We ourselves come from the news background. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, oh, it's, really? oh yeah, well it's 25 years for me in, in, in the business and did just about everything. Like you said, I started off in the studio doing camera work all the all over the place did news producing and wrote and like yeah so right. it's just crazy how many people in this industry come from that background it's yeah just i had no idea honestly <laughs> yeah, until we started doing yeah well this. you know you, you 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 really have to be a jack of all trades when you're a news producer and a news writer right yep. because yeah. you're not only yeah. writing you're doing the voiceovers sometimes you're you're in the editing bay and you have to cut very quickly you're put cutting together a two-minute package in three hours or That's two right. hours and you got to get it on the air, and so and you're working with talent. Um, so it really is a real quick way for you to kind of learn the basic skills you need to do storytelling. That's with, right, especially that if you're in a very a, easily. <laughs> especially yeah. if you're in a small market or a mid market, you're basically like a one man band. I mean, yeah, you're seriously. doing everything so. exactly. <laughs> I love right. it. Right. So you know it. what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. man. Absolutely. And yeah. I mean, so I love though that you made the transition from like kind of television and what what was that like key factor where you said, "Okay, I want I kind of want to jump to the film side. I, I kind of want to do features." Like what what made you start to go there? Well, you know, I I had been doing reality like an unscripted successfully for many, many years, you know, uh, at one point in time we were doing top model like two cycles a year. Oh, wow. So like I would be in production, pre-production, post-production, all at the same time. Like, I'd be shooting the current cycle, prepping the next cycle, and then it, it was just exhausting. And there was a number of years I was doing that, and I was producing some other, you know, reality series as well. And, you know, it, it gets to a point where, you know, you kind of get, you want to keep yourself creatively challenged. Right. Right. It's becoming kind of rote. It's becoming kind of run-of-the-mill. You're not really getting creatively excited anymore. And so I had started out uh, in the scripted side as a creative exec, on uh, uh, you know doing sitcoms and doing one hour dramas, and overseeing some you know you know those types of programs. Right. And I really wanted to get back into that. And uh, you know I knew if I wanted to keep creative control uh, in the film side, I knew that I would have to write. So you know when I had produced Invincible and I had produced Joy, you know those were really you know great experiences to have. But when you are a producer on a film, you are not the ultimate arbiter of the creative yes. on that film. Yep. It's really the director. You're there to service the director's vision. That's it. Uh, which is what any good producer does. And the producer really drives the engine of the picture and keeps it all together. But for me, as a creative person, I really wanted to keep control of that. So mm. when I you know, decided to do this film you know, a few years ago, I really said... You know, the only way to really have creative control is directing. And the only way that you can really direct is if you write your own scripts right. so that you can control who is going to direct that. So for the last five or six years, I really focused on writing. Mm. I really, you know, I had been writing for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, for the last 18 years or so, I'd been writing scripts. But for a number of years, 
you know, my script writing wasn't that good. I, I would say, and I'm pretty honest with myself, I said my writing probably was like at a B level or B plus level. And I didn't feel I was right ready to go out there because there are a lot of people in this town who are B and B plus writers. Mm-hmm. And you just get lost in the mix if you're that. You really have to be an A level writer to kind of get your writing noticed right. and to really kind of jump out of the pack. So I was only going to do that once I got my writing to a certain level. It took a long, long, long time. But finally, about four or five years ago, I kind of broke through as a writer. You know, I really felt confident about my craft. I was really happy with my skill. And that's when I just started to get out there to kind of get my writing seen. And it it was an arduous process, but I was able to get uh, this script, uh, which is called The Right One, uh, seen by other producers who were really enthusiastic about it and then got behind it, and then I just insisted that if we were going to make this film, because it was kind of a, it's a smaller indie, mm-hmm. uh, you know, lower end budget, I insisted that I was going to direct it, and luckily enough, uh, I was allowed to do that. Oh, that's fantastic. Did you have any other projects that you had written before that you thought could make the transition into the directing realm, or did you you feel like this was the one, this was the perfect one for you to take that next step? No, it's funny, you know, in the last five years... I've actually written uh, five different film projects that I love, and I, I love all of them. Mm-hmm. And um, I've kind of lined them up um, as projects that I'm going to do. There you go. Um, but I thought there was another project that I was going to do that I thought was going to be the first one that was going to be able to get made first. Mm-hmm. But what happened was when I started talking to the producers, um, all the five films that I have are in different genres. Oh, that's cool. Though. The one that they said we should really go with first is this one because it's a romantic comedy. Um, it's a smaller budgeted picture. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the type of movie that can get sold very easily because we did raise the money through independent financing. So we decided to go with, with this script first. I really thought this was not going to be the first picture that was going to get made. I really thought it was going to be like the third or fourth, but it was the first one that we decided to go forward with, and, and that's how it came to be. I, you know, I, I love the approach, though. I, I love the, okay, I've got to write it because I want to stay in creative control, and then realizing sometimes the writers, you know, a studio will come in, buy that, they'll, they'll give it to a producer, they'll give it out to a director, and all of a sudden that script that you wrote isn't even close to yeah, what, not what even you the had same written. Thing. So I love <laughs> the fact that you're like, no, I need to direct this too. I'm going to write it and direct it to keep right. my creative vision. So I love that. And talk a little bit about the, the, the financing process because we have a lot of up-and-comers that listen to the podcast, and a lot of them, you know, they, they, they tune in to, to listen to the insides of that. And so I love when people bring up the aspect because it's not an easy thing to do to raise money for a film especially an indie film even low budget that's not a difficult thing um did you go crowdfunding route did you go angel investor or when you say uh you financed it you know outside how did you bring that in you know you it's really important that you get people that believe in your project so you know with my script i had to kind of get it out there and get other producers start to start reading the project i got very lucky that there was a woman named jennifer sanderson who saw my script, who read my script and said, oh my God, I love this script and I really want to get this, this movie made and I'm going to go out and I'm going to raise the money for this. And so she actually put together a small VC fund. There you go. And that she, she went to people up in Silicon Valley and she was able to raise you know, money, uh, the money for this. And then this other producer came on named Geneva Wasserman uh, who was able to use the equity that was put into the movie to now uh, create debt financing for it. So every independent film is a mixture of equity and debt. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's how you get your film made. That's it. And it is, it is really the hardest, hardest part of the process uh, to, get, to get done. Oh, yeah, the money. So, the, the um, finding the money, that's always the difficult <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah, find, no, and finding the money and finding the people who will go out and do that for you, right? Yep. You know, it's, it's just interesting. I was, I was like watching online today this old interview with, you know, Quentin Tarantino when he was making Reservoir Dogs. And, you know, he had a producer named Lawrence Bender mm-hmm. who was his champion. It was really the same thing, kind of like as me. It's like, you know, Jennifer Sanderson to me was Lawrence Bender to, to Quentin. So Quentin had written the script and mm-hmm. Lawrence Bender read the script and he's like, I'm going to go raise the money for you. And it's the guys like Lawrence Bender, the Jennifer Sanderson's that go out and can make that dream come true because 
they are just as excited about the project as you are, and they go out and they do the really, really hard job of raising the money for the film. That's it. That's it. And that's what it's all about, having those close-knit people that you can bring with to project to project that you can rely on. I mean, with the projects that you've produced in the past, do you normally have like a producing team that you bring with you to different projects? Or do you kind of like bounce around? Because it's all about who you know in the industry, right? So, I mean, do you bounce around and find different yeah. people to pull in? Or how does that work? You know, it, you know, it varies from project to project. Like, you know, when I did Invincible, you know, Invincible was a very, very different path. It right. was... You know, a story that I had found, you know, I, I, I had seen some piece on this guy, Vince Papali. I think it was on ESPN or it was on NFL or something like that. And, you know, it was, it was like Rocky in the NFL. That's right. And I said, oh, my God, this is, this is a major motion picture. Like, this is such a great story. It's got to be told. So basically, I got that guy's life rights as a producer. And then at that time, I wasn't writing yet. So I managed to get a writer to write a first draft of the script for free. Oh, wow. Like, wow. Completely did it on spec. This guy named Brad Gann. And after we got that script written and I had the life rights, we basically went to auction this project. And at that time in Hollywood, you could still auction scripts. There was a, there was a period of time where that was the big thing. You know, you would get these big-name writers who would write these spec scripts and then they would have their agent send it out to every major studio, and then the, the, the studios would bid on it, and these guys would get incredible amounts of money you know, to get their, their movies made. Mm-hmm. And so we were still at the tail end of that phase with Invincible where we could get this thing auctioned. So we had three studios bidding for this project, and then we ended up with Disney uh, because we knew that as an NFL movie, Disney was also with ABC and ESPN Absolutely. that we would get all the rights promotion for it. So that was a movie that got set up at the studio right away. Uh, On the film Joy, it was kind of like a similar thing where I had gotten the story, I had found the story for for Joy Mangano because I had worked with her actually on a unscripted TV series called Made in America. It was kind of like a Shark Tank version of this uh, reality show where she was a judge on it. And I remember I was sitting with her like in at lunch one day and she was telling me her story of how she came to be like the queen of HSN. Yeah. She was like this poor Italian housewife from Queens and she had all these, you know, shitty men in her life. And, you know, she was really struggling three jobs and then she became this inventor and she invented this mop, this thing called the miracle mop. And she was able to sell like millions of them and she became this millionaire. I said, boy, this, the story you told me is like amazing. I said, it really is kind of like almost invincible, but the female (laughs) version of invincible. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to shop that story around. And I had that, that, um, that story set up at at twentieth uh, at twentieth, yeah. Um, through uh, through a company called John Davis Productions, and he already had this strong deal with like everybody at at twentieth. So after we got that script written, uh, which I oversaw, we went out to directors with that 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 movie, and like there were a lot of directors that jumped on this project that wanted to do it. I won't even mention the names, but we ended up going with David O. Russell. So that movie got set up right away. You know, at uh, at twentieth, right? Uh, you know, very quickly. So both of those were studio movies. So those were very different paths than you know what I went through on the right one because right. you know this was very different because you know this was my writing and this was my directorial debut. So you know we had to go the independent financing route, Absolutely. and that, that was much more challenging. Well, let's get yeah. into it, the right one, because I I I feel like. You were able to get on somebody to cheerlead for you and raise the money for you because I think that it's an outstanding original concept. Romantic comedies, they're not, right? It's like like you said, rom-coms, they're popular, they're easy to sell, they're good. Mm-hmm. But So you have to find a niche. You have to find why is mine different. And I think what you came up with is absolutely brilliant about a guy who a woman thinks, oh, I finally found my guy. He's the right one for me. But is he because he's never actually really – have we even seen him? Is he the guy or – I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Talk about that process. Where did that idea even come from? Yeah, that, that was interesting how that idea came about. It, 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 you know, came, it came from two different sources. You know, one is, um, you know, I'm fascinated with the late actor uh, Peter Sellers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're from, you know, uh, oh, yeah. he did, you know, uh, you know, he was Inspector Clouseau and, yep. um, you know, and did Being There. And he's like a brilliant, brilliant British actor. Um, and what he was really known for was he was a brilliant mimic. He could play any character. He could do any kind of 
British accent or Indian accent. He played all these different characters whose career, and he was absolutely a genius at it. But in reality, and this is told by everybody who knew him, when he was not playing a character, he didn't know who he was. Ah. He literally was a cipher. And people said he was actually mentally unstable because he had no sense of himself. He only came alive when he was playing a character, and I found that fascinating. So I did a lot of research on him. I read a lot of books about Peter, um, and I just found him incredibly complex. And I always wanted to do a movie about someone who could play other people but couldn't find their own selves, and what would cause that? Why would somebody be that way? Mm -hmm. And then... I had read this article about this woman a few years ago who was like a big social media influencer. And she suddenly quit one day because she said everything that she was posting on social media, on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, was fake. Right. It was like this curated version of her. It wasn't who she was. And it really started making me think about like identity in our culture now. It's like, I think we're living in an adult in, in a culture now where nobody's authentic anymore, right? Everybody who's posting themselves on Instagram or putting themselves on social media isn't posting the real version of themselves. They're kind of posting the idealized version of themselves. And so what is happening to identity in our culture now? So when I took the combination of those two things together, I kind of came up with this this story about this man who has lost himself from these characters and what has caused him to be that person. Oof, that's deep. Yes, yes. I like that though because <laughs> I feel like not a lot of rom coms get that deep. But I'm this one. Ooh, I'm I'm excited now. I, I'm excited. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the, the trailer is absolutely brilliant. And talk about the cast. The cast is phenomenal. Yes, I agree. Freaking yeah. Uh, uh, I'm so we're so pumped because I'm a huge fan of uh, the girl who played Kelly in the movie. Oh, uh, uh, you mean uh, Eliza Schlesinger? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, she's got so many yeah, freaking yeah. Uh, Netflix stand-up specials right now. Me and my girlfriend watch her all the time, so I'm so <laughs> super pumped to see this. Yeah, look, I, I think she's terrific in the movie. I think she's actually really going to break out uh, uh, from this movie and really get a lot of attention. She's She's hilarious in this film. I had actually written the part for her. Oh, there you go. Uh, with her in mind. And so I was lucky enough to be able to get her. And then, you know, I was really lucky with uh, Cleo, Cleopatra Coleman, who plays mm -hmm. Sarah, and Nick Thune, who's this really funny comedian who plays the character of Godfrey. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about <laughs> all of this was that I had actually originally written the, the, the movie for another actor who oh, will remain wow. a name. Mm -hmm. And then that actor had dropped out six weeks before I was shooting. Ugh. So I was in actually in Vancouver prepping the movie. Damn. And so the lead actor drops out. And because the lead actor dropped out, the lead actress dropped out as well because they Ugh. were friends. Yeah. Wow. So well, welcome to I the was world of literally. Yeah, I was yeah gonna, no, I was just going to say, welcome way, to the world all of, the time in indie filmmaking. Exactly, exactly. That's, exactly. Nice. that's exactly what I was going to say. Welcome to the world of indie filmmaking. So, for anybody out there listening yeah. that wants to jump in, prepare. <laughs> exactly. So, so I had you know six weeks before the film started, both leads drop out, and we were scrambling to you know get Nick and Cleo, and we were lucky enough to with two weeks before we started shooting, land both of them. Wow. Literally two weeks before we started shooting, I got both my leads into the roles. And I got very lucky with them because they're really, really great in the film. And the film turned out, you know, really wonderfully. That, yeah. That's can, fantastic. Can we just stress to everybody out there that's wanting to be a filmmaker – especially indie filmmaking, how important pre-production is. Yeah. Because let me tell you, if you lose your leads and you're two weeks out from shooting and you haven't done a good job in pre-production, you're screwed. I mean, you're basically like totally screwed. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to yeah. you, man, for holding it all together and clearly being prepped and well and, and able to just go right in. Um, I, I think that's another thing when you make this transition and you do these careers, right? You have to be flexible. You have to just prepare for everything and know everything will go wrong and you have to have a contingent. Agency. So um, kudos to you, man, for pulling that off. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It, it really was, it was really, really stressful. And I remember that I would, and, and you're absolutely right, you, you do have to have your film prepped properly so that once you do hit the ground running and you're shooting on day one, everything's set in place. So yep. really the only thing that I could do while we were waiting to get our two leads was prep the film as best I could. So 
I prepped every location. I prepped the whole production design. Me and the DPs had every shot down. We had boarded everything out. Um, we had cast everybody else in the film, and we shot up in Vancouver, so we, we had a Canadian cast for, for much of the film. So literally everything was in place with everybody and every department. All we had to do was just plug in these two leads. There you go. But I do remember I would be driving around to locations with my producer, my Canadian producer, who was a veteran producer who had been put on the movie to really just kind of help, you know, be the person I would lean on in this mm. production because he had produced something like 20-something Canadian films. Oh, wow. And I kept on saying to him, like, okay, we're five weeks out. We don't have our leads yet. We're four <laughs> weeks out. We don't have our leads yet. I'm like, Jason, is this normal? It's like, is this, is like, is this normal? And Jason kept on saying to me very calmly, like, Ken, don't worry about it. I've done 20 of these movies. This happens all the time. There was one movie where I directed where we didn't get our lead till like six days before we started shooting. Oh, so oh, it'll all work out. Three weeks out. Is this normal, Jason? Ken, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks out. Are we okay? Jason, absolutely. You're absolutely fine. Then finally, after we landed Cleo and Nick, <laughs> we go out to this location and Jason says, I got to tell you, Ken, I was getting really nervous. Oh my goodness. This really has never happened to me before. <laughs> oh man, so good. But then when it all oh comes together and you pull it all off, <laughs> that rush that you get, right? That you were able to do it, you know, I mean, there's no feeling like it in the world, man. Well, I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I have yet to experience that feeling, guys, because once you get the leads, now you're faced, now you're shooting on day one. Oh, yeah. So it's, there's no relief. It's like, <laughs> oh, now you got to start shooting, right? This and then, true. you know, it's, you know, with every indie film, and you've heard these stories, you know, you know, from everyone, like, indie filmmaking is like being in a war zone and it's, it's you know you're constantly looking at the budget and the budget's getting cutting back and people are not giving you permits and then i got 5 days cut from my shooting schedule Ugh. so you know you know on an indie film you're already shooting like you know i i was slated to shoot 28 days i ended up shooting 23 wow and you're shooting on location the whole time practical so half your day is taken away because you're doing company moves yep so you have very little time to get the shooting done. So, you know, I literally was running around like with my like a chicken with my head cut off, like <laughs> all twenty three days. You know, managing to make my days. And you know, there's scenes in that movie literally where you know we're at two a.m. in the morning, and I've got to wrap up in fifteen minutes, and I've got five setups to do. Oh my god! And goodness. you're literally getting one take done on you know each setup Absolutely. before you move on. One take and a safety. So. You know, I, I didn't get any relief shooting the film, and then in post, you're not getting your relief in post, and now you're worried about, you know, how the movie's going to be, be That's received right. That's what I was going to say. Distribution comes, yeah. right? Distribution comes, and COVID yeah. strikes, and you're like, crap, are we going theatrical? How are we, how are we people going to see this, right? Talk about that a little bit. Exactly. What, what was that whole process? Did you think the whole time you were going we're gonna to get theatrical, and then... Boom, no, like, uh, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, like we were really hoping to, but then all of a sudden COVID hit and then, you know, everything shut down. And then, you know, it really kind of actually, aside from distribution, really changed the, the notion of the film because when I originally wrote the film, the film was not really written to be thought of as a romantic comedy. It really was written as a drama with some comedic elements to it. Mm. It was really a more of a kind of a darker film. And the interesting thing that happened was when I started shooting the movie, the lead actress I have, Cleopatra Coleman, who is fantastic. She oh, yeah. is so talented. She started showing me that she could do comedy. So we were doing a lot of takes where I would allow the actors to improv. Oh, that's awesome. And there was one particular day, um, where she did this improv and it was so funny that it changed the entire scene from kind of like more of this dramatic scene to this comedic scene. And I realized that the whole tone of the film was changing because she was bringing this unexpected comedy to the film that I was not really thinking about. So what happened was I quickly started rewriting the script to match her comedy. So I had her doing a lot of comedy Eliza Schlesinger, who plays Kelly, does a lot of the comedy in the film, and then you have Godfrey. So all of a sudden, the film changed in tone. And then when I was cutting the movie, my producer came to me during COVID and said, 
listen, this film cannot be a drama with comedy to it anymore. Nobody wants to see that. This film has to be a comedy with some drama to it. Mm. It's got to be more of like a romantic comedy. So halfway through post, I had to completely recut the film. Oh, wow. Right? So initially it was completely a different tone. I had to eliminate a lot of the different darker scenes and then reshape it to what is now this really fun, sweet, romantic comedy film. So it, it, it shows you the amazing things that you can do in post, uh, you know, in cutting, right. and also like using ADR and doing some selected reshoots to make the film conform. So the film that has come out now, which I'm really proud of and very happy with, and everybody who's seen it already is like really, really very happy with the film, is very different from what it was conceived as originally. Oh, Interesting. That, that's fantastic. And how will the fans be able to see this thing? Is it going to be theatrical release limited, or is it going to be on a streamer somewhere? Or? Well, it's going to be on demand and digital. Okay. Uh, that's how all features are now getting released in mm-hmm. this country right now, because you can't go to the theater. Yeah. So on, on February 5th, it'll be on demand and digital on all platforms. So if you go online, you go to Apple, you go wherever, you'll be able to buy and download the film. Fantastic. Um, and then uh, I think like 90 days later, um, it'll go to a streaming service. So they're discussing that deal right now, and we'll figure it out. But uh, it's being released on demand and digital worldwide on the 5th of February. Fantastic. Awesome. And I mean, what do you think about the streaming services right now? Because HBO, I'm sure you saw HBO Max just made this huge yeah. decision to release simultaneously in some select theaters and on HBO Max at the same time, the biggest one being Wonder Woman 1984. Do you think that is yeah. like kind of a knife in the heart to the theaters and people are going to go focus on streaming now? Or what do you think about that? Well, you know, I think a lot of people in the, in this town, especially filmmakers, are really upset by yeah. what's been happening. Um, you know, I'm not happy about it either. Uh, I think it does a whole complete disservice to uh, the filmmaking community. Um, I do think that, you know, once COVID ends... I do think uh, theaters will come back. I think, you know, the thing about, you know, movies, it's a communal experience. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, I mean, there's, streaming is great. We all stream and stuff. But I think for a lot of films, you know, the communal aspect of it, being able to go into a theater with other people, being to laugh with other people, cry with other people, share an experience with other people is going to be not only as important as it was before, but I think more important because I think with COVID, What's happened is we've isolated ourselves so much. Everybody in this country is yearning to be out there with other people, right? I think it's pent up. And I think when theaters come back and I think when everybody gets vaccinated, we get back to some sort of normalcy by next, you know, the end of summer and the fall. I think people will be, you know, hopefully flocking back to theaters because I think people have an innate need to be with one another. Mm. Um, And I think that's one of the experiences that people get to share. Yeah, completely agree. We uh, we do a top five segment on the show, and last week's top five was uh, top five things we missed about 2020, and on both of our lists, we were like, human interaction. We didn't get to meet new people. Yeah. We didn't get to shake hands <laughs> when we it. met somebody. <laughs> like, it. it was really weird. And going to the movies. That was also yeah, yeah, on the list. So you, you the nailed list. both of them right there. So. <laughs> All um, right. Oh, man. So, look, I, I have a feeling it's going to do extremely well for you. I agree. Which begs to ask, will there be a director's cut with the dark version? Ooh. Hey, ooh. Just throwing that out there. Just throwing <laughs> that out there. <laughs> if this one booms and everybody uh, loves the rom-com, how about the dark version? Um, but we really, congratulations. We think it's going to be yeah. r- really successful. And, and like you said, it's it's the movie that people need right now, So, um, which is always good, which is always good in this craziness that is yeah. COVID. Um so listen, so like what we like to do, and this the whole interview has kind of been this, but we're going to yeah. ask anyway. What we like to do at the end of the interviews is kind of have you leave some advice for the up-and-comers. Um, like what advice would you give uh, to anybody trying to get into the industry? And it doesn't necessarily have to be as a producer, writer, director, just anybody trying to get into the industry. And what pitfalls would you say to avoid? Well, look, I, I think right now it's the most exciting time you know, for content creators uh, because – you know, there's complete democratization of, of content now. Everybody is a content creator. Everybody yep. is a filmmaker now. You know, you've got your phone, you're doing your TikToks, you're creating content. You're, you know, there's 50 million, you know, sites that you can go onto Instagram on, which is Cinephile or Industrial Films or whatever it is. 
and you can see what all your friends and colleagues are doing with their little handhelds. Yes. You know, uh, and their little, you know, filming equipment. Everybody is making films. So I think it's the best time in the world for you to go out and, and make a movie. It's, it's never been easier to make a movie. You know, obviously, if you want to go the traditional route and you want to go the studio route, you know, it's an incredibly hard thing. But, you know, there's so many different platforms now. You know, content has exploded all over. So if you have, you know, the desire, you know, and you have the creative ability and, and, and desire, you can go do it. So, you know, the one thing that I would encourage everybody who's, who's out there who wants to, you know, get a movie made, just go make it. You know, you have the toolkit, you have the tool set, you can do it for nothing. You can, you know, get your friends together and make these movies and do it on, you know, your own laptop and get these into the ever expanding, you know, world of, you know, film festivals now. That's it. You know, and, and and get yourself known. So, you know, but the thing is you have to do it. Like nobody else is going to do it for you. Nobody's going to come in give you a film to direct. You know, nobody's going to give you a film to direct. you you have to do it yourself and really kind of, you know, uh m- make your career your own by being proactive on it. Um and, you know, the pitfalls are, you know, uh, as always, uh, you know, raising money to make your movie. But, you know, nowadays you can make some of these small films, you know, for 25 grand or 50 grand. You know, what you do is you go to your parents and your uncles and your aunts and you, you, you do a crowdfunding with your family or you do crowdfunding on the Internet. That's it. And you can get these projects made. But the, I think the key is that whatever project you take on, you have to be 100% passionate about it. You have to believe in it 100% because it takes so much energy to get a project made, right? Whether it's a small film or a big film, it takes a lot of energy. And if you don't believe in your project, you might as well stop right then and there because you'll be sunk. You want to do it for the right reasons. You don't want to do it for exploit. To me, it's like you have less chance of success if you're doing a project because it fits a certain genre or you feel you can make money with it or you can do this or you can do that. The projects really that have the greatest chance of success are the ones that you believe in 100% that mm. you, have pas- you are passionate about because when you make it, you're putting your heart and soul into it. So that maximizes your chance of making that project not only successful but good. Mm. And that's the stuff that's going to get you the attention that you want to get. Oof. That, yes. that gave me chills right yes. there. That, yes. that was so yes. good. Yes. I love it. And I hope everybody listening takes heed to that. Like, you got to have the passion and you got to be doing it for the right reasons. Otherwise, yes. why do it at all? Exactly. It's not a hobby. Exactly. It's, it's really not a <laughs> no. hobby. So many people go out to LA, right. like, trying to do it, like, part time. No, you have to completely commit your life to it to if this is what you want to do absolutely absolutely well listen man thank you so much for coming on and talking about the film and just your history and your background was so interesting to hear your path and your journey to get to where you are now i know the listeners are going to absolutely love this and um let's tell everybody where they can find you i'm assuming you're on social media correct yep i am i'm like ken mock on instagram ken mock on twitter I have a new TikTok, uh, you know, account that I'm now kind of giving, uh, talking about everything related to the entertainment business and giving tips to people about the entertainment business and awesome. production. Uh, that just started last week, so we're going to start posting there with my team. And like I said, the most important thing is the right one is coming out on digital and on demand there on you February go. 5th. It's a great, fun, romantic comedy, as you guys were saying. It's just sweet and funny, and it's a feel-good movie, and that's something that this country really <laughs> needs right now. Yes. I think if you watch this movie, you'll just feel, I think, a little bit better about yourself. You'll feel better about humanity in general when you watch that's this film. Right. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's being released on the 5th because it's a great Valentine's film. So if you got Absolutely. your girlfriend, you got your boyfriend... You got your wife, you got your husband. It's a great date night movie. I, I promise you, you'll come away from this movie with a smile, and you'll probably want to watch it again. It's one of those movies that you can watch over and over again. There you go. They, so add marketing to it, too. Right. Right? Writer, producer, it. director, marketer. Like That was an excellent <laughs> marketing job right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks guys yes listen man thanks so much and open invite man anytime you want to come back and just shoot the shit or you have another project you want to talk about or just what this has been fantastic man open invite absolutely thank you really appreciate it and I uh, had a lot of fun talking to you alright man 
fantastic. Have a good one now. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. That was so good. Yeah. Wow. It, it, it's just – I just love his determination. It's like, yeah, I've been doing this and it's getting kind of stale. It's getting kind of – I got to find something else to exactly. keep me going, you know? So. And have that mainstream studio success and that indie success. Like just bouncing around everywhere because that's just – if you're passionate about a project, you don't care how it gets made as long as it gets made. Yeah, and it, it definitely shows that he's doing it for all the right reasons because like you said, when you have that type of studio success – I mean you get Bobby. Okay, yeah. we we're talking De Niro. Okay. Right. You, you would think I'm just going to stay in the studio system and keep doing yeah. this, right? But no, I'm going to jump away from this and I'm going to do indie. Yeah. Like the hardest thing ever to do. So that just shows he's a filmmaker. Exactly. Right? That's awesome. Exactly. I mean, you got freaking Wahlberg, bro. That's you right. got Wahlberg. <laughs> and there it is, the Ravens yeah. edition right there. Bobby De Niro, Wahlberg, bro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So good. So good. All the up and comers are going to enjoy this one. Thank you again, Ken, for coming on the show. All right, now it is time for the top five segment, yes. and I'm super excited about this because, honestly, it was one of my favorite subjects in school. Um, top five movies about history. I'm talking about history. Yes. Uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. You can learn so much from entertainment. You I can. mean, that we, we, I've been saying that for the past while now. I mean, yep. entertainment is the best form of edu- education, in my uh, opinion. I totally agree. And history was my favorite subject, like, yep. totally. So this is a fun one. I yeah. agree. And this, this segment might even become historical. <laughs> right. I, just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Oh, man, it's great. <laughs> uh, starting with my number five, I'm going with Public Enemies. Everybody knows Ooh. I am a huge gangster guy. I love John Dillinger because he's uh, went through Indiana and stayed there for a while. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, but... Also, Public Enemies, our buddy Spencer Garrett was in yes. that film. Of course, we got to throw that one on there. And I mean, Johnny Depp was one of the biggest at that time. Uh, just a great overall story. And there's still a lot of like, was that really him that they killed? Like, there's still a lot of like, eh, I don't know. I don't That's know right. if it was. So yeah, Public Enemies, my number five. My number five, All the President's Men. Mm. About, Nixon. About Nixon. Deep Throat. Dustin Hoffman. You know, yes. Robert Redford. Yes. Fucking brilliant movie. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. If you don't know the story of Nixon and the downfall of Nixon and, and the whole Watergate scandal and all the president's men, that's all you need to know. Enough You'll said. pass any t- history test. It's fantastic. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Uh, my number four goes to Harriet. That one came out like a year or two ago. Um, that one was absolutely brilliant. Got snubbed at the Oscars, it in did. my opinion. Um, but just so freaking good, guys. If you haven't seen this one, be sure to check it out. I think that one's on HBO Max as well, or uh, Apple or Showtime, whichever. But mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. one was so good, of course, about Harriet Tubman freeing slaves, bringing them to the North, and still like going back and getting more. Like It was just an amazing story, and so this one was very entertaining a lot of like the his- history movies can like drag a little bit but this one was very entertaining definitely worth the watch absolutely absolutely okay my number four daniel day lewis steven spielberg enough said you should know exactly what i'm talking about lincoln mm. it was fucking brilliant daniel day lewis as abraham lincoln was phenomenal yeah mary todd with uh, sally field playing mary todd lincoln and like just Everything about the film was absolutely brilliant. This is how brilliant that film was, okay? It was about whether the amendment to free slaves was going to pass, right? You you know history. You know it passed. You know how it was going to end. You were still biting your nails. You were still like, holy shit, how is this going to go down? Is this going to happen? It's gonna... You knew what was going to happen. It was like the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You knew, but the movie was that good. You were still like riding the seat like, oh my God, oh my God, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. It was so epic. It was so epic. So and good. it ends before he gets shot. Mm. Yep, it ends with him headed off, but yeah. we never see it. So. Yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis, one of the best actors of our time. Uh, and Spielberg, one of the best directors. Exactly. Just makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> uh, number three for me is Cool Running. Yes. This is such an inspirational story about a Jamaican bobsled team, which is a winter sport, guys. You guys know it doesn't fucking snow in Jamaica. Uh, so it's just epic to see like all these positive people just being like, you know what? 
we're going to the Olympics no matter what. And it's a cool story because they were supposed to be, you know, sprinters. They were supposed to be runners running like the mile and shit. That's right. Or the 40 yard dash. I don't know what they compete in with the Olympics. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but still, just having that drive and that determination to get to the Olympics no matter what. And I mean, a lot of people can take advice from that because no matter what, you can still see your dream through. Yes. And that's what you need to take away from that movie because that's absolutely right. That's yeah. a brilliant movie. Okay. My number three, it's a Tom Cruise movie. I know what you're thinking. Like, he bashes Tom all the time. But I love his movies. It's one of his favorite it's, actors. It, Don't I, let him lie no, to you. No, he really is. is. He's one of my favorite <laughs> actors, just not one of my favorite people. But, I mean, you know, there it is. It's like I can, I can, I can separate. But this film is one of my all-time favorite films. I'm not even going to lie. Ken Watanabe and, like, Tom Cruise, The Last Samurai. It's basically the story of the American Civil War guy who kind of, like, helps the, the samurai take on – the Western world has come over. They've given machine guns. They're kind of like building an army with the Japanese who want to take over and like revolutionize and like Americanize Japan. And the samurai and the ninja and all of the last breed of those type warriors are trying to hold on for what, you know, the last little guy. And this American comes over and basically teaches them and they teach him and he becomes a samurai, yeah. a legit samurai. And he tries, he fights to his death. To protect these samurai from from the Japanese, like eh. it's a brilliant fucking movie, and it's fictionalized, but it's based on actual events that went down. Yeah. So brilliant and beautifully shot. The fucking cinematography is just phenomenal. Yeah, and it was the first introduction for me for Ken Watanabe, who mm. went on to the, the Dark Knight or Batman Begins. Yeah, um, and just it's a brilliant movie, guys. Check yeah. it out. Definitely, definitely. My number two goes to Black Klansman. Woo! I mean, Adam Driver is one of my favorite actors, so it makes sense. But this story was overall epic. If you guys don't know, it's about detectives like infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan. Yep. And basically, like a black man talking to David Duke over the phone and building a relationship with him, but then in person, it being Adam Driver. It's just a great story. It's a Spike Lee joint, so be sure to check that one out, but it's just so freaking good, guys, and I mean, very educational, and definitely, there's stuff still going on like this today, so I definitely watched this one, and uh, that one also got snubbed at the Oscars. Yeah, yeah, which I, I think also launched Washington's career into, like, superstardom. Yeah, you know, I like, agree. like I really, I really think so. He's everywhere now. He is, and I can't wait to see him in Zendaya and that mm -hmm. new Netflix one. It's going to be badass. Um, my number two, one of the hardest films I have ever sat and watched in the first like 10 minutes of it. It's just absolutely brutal and the most realistic thing I've ever seen in film. Honestly, to this day, it's just brutal. And you know what I'm talking about if we're talking about historical movies, but um, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. That storm in the beach scene. Uh, oh my God. I, I just, I, every time I watch, I just get chills. It's like, just terrifying to think these men actually went through that. You know, they're like dragging a guy to safety, not even realizing half his fucking body is missing. Yeah. Or like those helmets you're wearing, they don't protect shit. Bullets go right through it. And like, just like, it's terrifying. They're called the greatest generation for a fucking reason because these people like did things that I guarantee people nowadays would never even fucking dream of doing. Agreed. They won't even wear a fucking mask. Yeah. But these guys were storming that beach, man. Oh my God. Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks, and, and just Steven Spielberg again. Like uh, just, so many great actors in that. Yeah, one. Matt like, Damon, just like so many, like uh, just ugh, check it out. Yeah, if you've probably already seen it, but if you haven't, check it out. Exactly, exactly. My number one. My name is Alexander Hamilton. Yes, Alexander Hamilton. Oh my gosh, guys, this one is just so freaking good, so educational. Lynn. Manuel Miranda, oh my gosh, he just blessed the country and the world with Hamilton, especially making the deal with Disney and Disney Plus and being released. Uh, yes. But this was such a good freaking musical slash film. Like, just every everything about it was just so fantastic. Everybody knows all the songs now. Everybody knows the story. It's so good. It's I, That's all I have to say. It, it might be one of the best ensemble casts ever put together. I agree. In my opinion. Yeah. I just think it, they're absolutely brilliant. There's not a single person cast in that that didn't do it brilliantly. I agree. It's just like well done. I agree. Done. And then dethroned Phantom of the Opera for me. That yeah. was my favorite musical. Now it's Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton. Like, and I think it's going to, for a long time, coming. Like, that's going to be hard to beat that. It is. It's going to be hard to beat that. Spamalot's not going to do it. 
No, it's really not. <laughs> it's not it going to really do it. Not. It's not. <laughs> my number one, one of my most favorite movies of all time, I'm talking about The King's Speech, about how Queen Elizabeth's daddy had to overcome after he became king and the, the onset of World War II and give the most important speech of his life to lead the UK into the war and Churchill. And, uh, and, and as you guys know, or maybe you don't know because you don't know history, but here's your chance with entertainment to yes, learn history. Exactly. He had a stuttering problem. He was terrified to speak in public. And his wife and uh, all kinds of people helped him kind of get through it to be able to give this now most monumental epic speech in in history uh and so there you go guys i mean the king's speech it's f- what well, colin firth and like just like it's an amazing cast helena yes. bonham carter plays his wife it's just brilliant it's brilliant yeah check it out that's my number one exactly man so so many good movies about history out there what are your top five we want to know be sure to comment below on the youtube channel be sure to comment in the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast and of course over social media we're all over social media so you guys know we will answer back in a reasonable time uh box office going over the recap 1984 wonder woman it is still number one by no surprise because there's nothing else out yet um (laughs) with three million brought in three million last week number two is is Crude's A New Age, which popped back up. Um, it was like a number four or some shit. Yeah. Um, that one brought in 1.8 million. Number three was News of the World, brought in 1.2 million. And Monster Hunter came in at number four with 1.1 million. And Fatal with um, came in at number five with 670,000. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, there it is. New movies coming out, maybe in a theater new you. Uh, Run, Hide, Fight. Oh, okay. Uh, is that but, like a, like when a ter- like people break in school shooters right? or like I mean that that's like the thing you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. Run, hide, and at last, if it uh, yeah, all if else it fails, comes fight. to it. Um, just... uh, the marksman at number two. Are... <laughs> if the marksman gets yeah. in, run, hide, and fight. Like, right. Like, yeah. uh, don't tell a soul. Jumanji level one and our friend. <laughs> oh, movies you could maybe still go see. Promising young woman. Pinocchio. The War with Grandma, Grandpa, um, Come Play, and Alien. Bobby is just hanging. He really is. He will not go away. Bobby will not no. go away. He's I will do it. I'm not going to do it. Now heading over to the IMDb Pro Top Trending segment. You guys know we love this app. We literally use it for damn near everything entertainment related. J-Lo showers with it. I do. That's true. It's very nice. Sure. It's got a nice Facts. scent. It's got a nice scent. <laughs> it's that color. Out. The color scheme on IMDb Pro. It's like Irish Spring. It is. It's like it's, you know. It's so great. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, the top trending movie is Soul. Disney Plus's Soul. It's really good, guys. If you haven't checked it out. Yeah, have you checked it out yet? Oh, yeah, I was about to say. Yeah. oh, definitely. Yeah, in fact, I'm having a hard time weighing it now. Like, a- a- anybody who knows me for the longest time, The Incredibles was like that's my Pixar film. Yeah, you know that the uh, like that's the best Pixar film ever, even above Toy Story, all that. But now, I know I mean, Soul, Soul is was really so good. fucking good. It's like maybe it's gonna take the top spot for me. I think. Yeah, I mean, just just Tina Fey and Jamie Foxx. Well fucking done. Yes. Just brilliant. Agreed. Brilliant. Agreed. Uh, Top trending TV show is Cobra Kai. Makes sense. Honestly, the third season might be tied for my favorite season with uh, season one. Yes. Obviously. But um, just really good, man. Really good. I like where everything ended up besides Robbie. Um, But just if you guys have not checked out the freaking Cobra Kai series on Netflix once was on YouTube. It's just so damn good, guys. Be sure to check that one out. And I think it's like they have done a brilliant job of paying homage to but also poking fun at the, the film series. It's like it's comedic, but it's also dramatic, and it's while it's paying all kinds of homage and tribute to the original films, it's also like ridiculously making fun of a lot of the ridiculous stuff from the films. So that I mean, to be able to do that yeah. and, and effectively do it, that that's brilliant. And bringing so many people back too, like yeah. Allie from the first movie, yeah, and Elizabeth Shue, yeah, what's her face from the second movie where they go over to Japan, yep, and like the freaking. Uh, the enemy from the second movie. Chosen. I like yeah. how they ended up being friends and he was about to whoop his ass honk. Bonk. Yeah. Like, like, that you know. was so freaking funny. Uh, man, yeah. Just such a good series. Such a good series. And the top trending star this week is Tanya Roberts. That makes total sense to me because was she, was she not, was she, was she not, she is. She is. 
deceased, passed yeah. away. Yeah. We lost her. So, this is the scary thing, though, to a fucking urinary tract infection. It's very scary. It's what? very common and, yeah, very freaking scary. Yeah, to think that you can die from it if you're not, like, getting the shit taken care of? What? Yeah. Mm. Drink water. That, that's it. Drink water, man. water. Because urinary tract infections happen when you don't drink a lot of water, you know, fluids and stuff. Like, just saying. Oh, my just goodness. Saying. It's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Uh, well, anyway, guys, thank you so much for getting a little crazy with us on episode 145. we got to thank our guest one more time, Ken Mock, for coming on the show. Be sure to follow him on social media. I believe it's just at Ken Mock yep. on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Yep. Uh, be sure to follow the company and the podcast on social media. Of course, you guys know at Crazy Ant Media and at ItCaf Podcast. And you guys know you can follow us both personally on social media, myself, JLo Fantastic, and Crazy Ant Guy 1970. That's right, buddy. And you guys know you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast. It's on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Stitcher, and so much more. If you are watching this video on YouTube, hello, hello. You like the Lakers jersey, the yeah, LeBron yeah, jersey? You like all the, the Mickey, Funkos, WandaVision, yeah. woo! So good, yeah. man. So good. Be sure to subscribe to the video, like or subscribe to the channel, like the video, and ring that bell for reached all out of to our... her. I reached out to her. Oh shit. Yep. Yep. I'm just saying. Let's see what happens. I need a ward. She might come on and ring the bell. That'd be I don't great. know. That'd, <laughs> That'd be, be so. Freaking I'm just great. saying. I reached out. She's in Memphis. She's like right, right. Like just uh, like we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see, man. We'll see. <laughs> But of course, be sure to visit our website, www.crazyantmedia.com, for all of the latest and greatest Crazy Ant Media gear. Girl power. New merch up right now. New Year's bonk, girl power. And of course, about to be a Valentine's Day design. So be sure to check all of that stuff out. It's all so good. There's so much stuff that happened in our industry news on this show that it's really hard to place just one little thing. I mean, of course, all the Marvel stuff. I like that Feige came out and said, no, I'm not going to oversee the Star Wars stuff, Mm. too, because I don't – He's a Marvel guy. He's not the person for it. I think John Favreau or Dave Filoni should. That those two should be together. Together. Yeah, I That'd think that would be badass. Yeah. Kathleen Kennedy get her out. I'm sorry, no disrespect, but let let Favreau and Filoni run it. Yeah. Because they clearly are are fans. They clearly know what they're doing. Just I agree. But so much good stuff, man. So much good stuff. Of course, I love talking about movies and history. I mean, such a good topic. Yeah. So, yeah, just a lot of good stuff on this show. Yeah. Well, you know my favorite was Marvel. Yeah. I mean, come on of now, course. guys. It's like everywhere I go. Joy Bryant. I was extremely thrilled to hear about Joy Bryant. Huge fan of Joy Bryant. Um, So super pumped for that. Uh, And, you know, I just – every Oprah. Yeah, right. Uh, Oprah. Literally. So, I mean – I'm excited. I've never watched a documentary about Oprah. About Oprah. Yeah, yeah, so many so many things where Oprah's telling us about yeah. things, but now we're going to get told about Oprah. Exactly. I love when she teaches me things. It's so good. <laughs> teach me how to cook. Teach me how to do anything, Oprah. That's right. It sounded weird. It, it, it did. <laughs> now it's going to be even weirder when we say she's the only O that matters because is she going to... I don't. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> you know I mean? Oprah going to teach him how to have the best O ever. Oh I don't God. know. Oh, oh, God. God. You oh. know. We love her. Oprah. Oprah.